because Ely, um, Zach Eady, was dominating them in the first half. Mm -hmm. He was unstoppable. But you can see even in the first half by UConn running up and down the court, their big man running up and down the court. Why? Because he know he has help on the bench. Mm -hmm. He can go sit down for five minutes. Zach Eady can't do Eady that. Was Gas exactly, and they just they just wore the big fella down. Yeah, and he did all he can do. At the end, you saw it. He started missing shots. You know, he was just playing a little bit. He was playing tired. Mm -hmm. He was fatigued, and um, you know, Hurley and that coaching staff did an excellent job at game planning for him, mm -hmm. making them chase picks, making them go through screens, tiring them out, and ultimately, at the end of the game, you just saw the better team. Zach Eady accounted for over half of Purdue's yes. point sauce. Right? Man. I mean, it was the Zach Eady show, and then mm -hmm. everybody else just couldn't get anything done. No. So it just felt inevitable. I mean, that UConn offense is so fun to watch. Mm -hmm. It's so seamless. It's so smooth. They pass so well. Mm -hmm. It just looks so effortless. It's all, it's a, it was all like watching ballet on uh -huh. our basketball court. <laughs> it was like, man, that was just pretty. Man, they just made that look so easy. Um, good game last night. I'm not going to say great game. It was a yeah, good game. Yeah, it was a good game. I could have done without the 8.30 tip-off. Yeah, that was late. That was late. That was late. Like, so. like, like what about the like 6.30 p.m. tip-off? Exactly. Then it's Everybody gets to bed at, at a sensible hour. I mean, uh, luckily, it did kind of get away from, away from uh, Purdue late. So if you wanted to go to bed with, at the four or five-minute mark, you could have. With like five and a half minutes yeah. left, I was like, okay, this yeah, game's over. Knew, and I finished the game, but win. once yeah. it was done, it was like, all right, I don't need to watch the Scott Van Pelt post-show. Exactly. I don't need to, <laughs> you know, once I saw Dan Hurley do all of his celebrations. Hey, Dan, Hur Dan Hurley was in, he, he was in the mood yesterday. Dan he, Hurley was feeling himself Yeah, yesterday. he was definitely, and I loved it. Yeah. I truly, because it wasn't, it wasn't out of arrogance. It was just like, Listen, I'm confident in what I do as a head coach, and I'm confident in the young men that I go out and recruit that, yeah, you may beat us. We may not make it one year because these guys are young, but watch out because we're coming. And he yeah. said that previously. He said, you better get us now because mm -hmm. we're coming. And they, and they damn sure came busting through the door and to win back-to-back -back national championships. But I just I, I enjoy watching him on that stage um, because even – even, you know, they were not the team talked about even in this tournament. It was it's boring exactly. watching a really good team uh -huh. just demolish every single team that they play. Yeah. Like the interesting games were the one that were ones that were very tightly contested and really close to the mm. very end. It got boring watching UConn <laughs> just beat everybody and make it mm. look easy in the process. Um, so UConn takes it back-to-back -back national champions the first time in the NCAA tournament since 2006 and 2007 when mm -hmm. Florida went back-to-back. -back. Yeah. We have back-to-back -back champions. So we'll get into that later on in the show, what comes next for Kentucky, some developments on that front. We'll get into that as well. Tim Hasselbeck will join us in just about 25 minutes. We'll get his thoughts on the pre-draft process, his thoughts on some draft tidbits that we're hearing coming out. So Tim Hasselbeck will join us right at 1130. But I wanted to get started here, D. Mace, and this was a Bill Barnwell article on ESPN.com. Headline is 2024 NFL Draft Round 1 Trades. Which teams should move up? So basically he just goes team by team, pick by pick. Should you move up? Should you stay put? Should you trade back? Should you move up a lot? Should you trade back a lot? Only trade back a little bit. So back and so Agree. Chicago will pick at one and they will take Caleb Williams. Washington Commanders at two. Bill Barnwell says, stay put. Mm -hmm. Any issues with that? Uh, no. Uh -uh. New England Patriots, stay put at three. Any issues with that? Uh, nope. Me neither. That's going to be quarterback, 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 whether it's Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, whether it's Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, in whatever order, it's going to be quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. And then he gets into how the Cardinals could trade down with a quarterback needy team. No problem with that. The Chargers, very interesting, could trade down with another quarterback needy team. I would agree that that's probably on the table here. Let's fast forward to the Tennessee Titans at seven. Before I get into what Bill Barnwell writes, what he thinks the Titans should do. D-Mace, when it comes to stay put, trade back, 
trade up. And of course that comes with, well, you need a trade partner. Yeah. Of course that comes with, well, how far do you trade up or trade back? Of course those specifics are incredibly important into this conversation. And there are conversations that Rand Carthon and Brian Callahan are having. But just when it comes to trade up, trade back, stay put, what would you do if you're running the Tennessee Titans? If my guy is there, I'm staying put. Um, I'm staying put until my guy is not there. Mm -hmm. Whoever you deem your guy, whether it's, you know, your, your top two guys, let's put it that way. If your top two guys are not there, then, okay, trade back, mm -hmm. acquire some picks. But don't trade back too far because you still want to be able to get whatever it is you're, you're seeking for this team, whether it be a left tackle, uh, whether it be an inside back, whether it be a defensive end, or, or a receiver. Whoever you are targeting, uh, make sure you can then still get them. I'm not too big on moving too far back because now you lose the opportunity to get possibly one of those top two to three tackles, one of those top two to three wide receivers, and possibly maybe even one of those top two or three defensive guys if you move too far back. Um, so if the guys that I have ranked high um, is still there, then, you know, no, I'm not trading now. Uh, but if they're not, then, yeah, I'm trading now. But it, it depends on how far back I go. And, and I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. that if, you, if your guy's there, then you stay put. Mm -hmm. If you have a trade partner, if you can pick up a couple of extra picks in this year's draft, hell, if you can pick up a first in next year's draft, yeah. absolutely that's something that I'm having the conversation mm -hmm. about. But understanding that we talked to TD yesterday, and I asked him kind of what's the line of demarcation in the first round between elite players and really good players and franchise changing players versus a little bit more of a gamble. And TD said it's, it's an inexact science, of course, mm -hmm. because you never know where players are going to fall. You never know how far the quarterbacks are going to push some of these elite players. But it's right around, and I feel like every draft is probably mm -hmm. the same, right around 14, 15, 16, right in that mid to late teens area. Maybe in some drafts it's more like 20. Maybe in some drafts it's more like 12 or 13. But really right in that sweet spot. I'm not in the business of trading back further than that. Mm -hmm. Because ideally, you're not picking in the top 10 in the future. Exactly. That would be ideal. So I'm going to take an elite game-changing franchise-altering player while I can rather than pick up a first in next year's draft or pick up other later picks in this year's draft just to trade back to what, like, you know, 27 mm -hmm. and get a player that's a little bit more of a gamble. What well, Bill Barnwell writes, however, so you and I are in the same page. Yes. You either stay put or you trade back a little bit if you, if you have a trade partner. I think really you and I and a majority of Titans fans and I think probably a majority of the people on our station would agree mm -hmm. with that sentiment. This is what Bill Barnwell writes. The Titans should trade up. He says, while Rand Carthon has made plenty of moves this offseason, the one position he conspicuously has not touched is offensive tackle. The Titans let Chris, Chris Hubbard hit free agency and cut free agent disaster on Ray <laughs> Dillard after one season, leaving them without many options at this position. Sadiq Charles played outside during his time in Washington with little success, while Nicholas petit Frere missed most of the 2023 season between a gambling suspension and a shoulder injury. Dylan Radens hasn't looked like an NFL NFL caliber offensive lineman Peter Skaronski, a first round pick last year, played tackle at Northwestern, but I'm not sure he showed enough at guard last season to make Tennessee feel confident about bumping him outside. Now, I agree with everything that he wrote. Mm -hmm. We heard from Brian Callahan, he told us on our show, Peter Skaronski is going to be a guard. Exactly. Bill Barnwell continues. Even if Skaronsky or Raiden start at one tackle spot, the Titans need to add another lineman to the mix. I would agree wholeheartedly. They've been popularly linked to Joe Alt at number seven, but the Chargers could add a right tackle at number five. Harbaugh already has highlighted the value of a strong offensive line in talking to the media. That could just be coach platitude, and everyone thinks having a strong offensive line is a good idea, but it could also hint toward what the Chargers are thinking. If the Titans want to ensure they land their tackle of choice, they probably need to give the Cardinals a call. What do you think? Oh, boy. I, I'm not cool. I, I, we're we're sort of buying into, and you know you know who's causing all this, right? Harbaugh. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that that's who's, cause, that's who's causing all of this chaos. P. 
people. And he loves it. Oh, you absolutely. Know he loves it. Absolutely. So to me, I'm not moving up. I, I'm not. Um, you know, I am not going to because you're trying to build this team. Mm -hmm. And to me, when you move up, that means what? You got to give up picks. And you're moving up from seven to four. That's going to cost you a lot. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you a lot. Now, if this was a, if this was the Houston Texans, let's just throw that out because they are the most recent up and coming team again. If this was the Houston Texans where we already know we got our quarterback, we already know we got our receivers, our running back, our offensive line is pretty good, our defense is top notch. If, if I'm in that situation, then yeah. I may trade up. Why? Because I got my pieces. We are a winning. We are a team ready to win now. So the only thing I'm doing is is adding more pieces and sacrificing later draft picks. You know, a year down the line or two. But I don't expect to be in the top 15 picking next year or the year after that or the year after that. I expect to be picking in the low 20s. Mm -hmm. So that first round draft pick isn't as big to me this time, this go around, as it probably was three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. If I'm the if I'm the Titans and I'm in that situation, yeah, I will move up because now I'm getting my guy, and now he's going to help like us you're win now. That player exactly. away from Absolutely. contending for a Super Bowl. Totally. But the Titans are not there; they're not one guy away from. They are several guys away from getting back in the mix. That's just getting back in the mix because right now they're still sort of on the outside looking in but they need that tackle spot. They need some depth every other place to make sure they now can be able to, they're now able to get in the mix. So to me, I'm not trading up. I trade back, but I'm damn sure not trading up because what is going to cost me? It's going to cost me first round picks to move up. And I'm, I don't have the luxury of giving up first round picks if I'm the Tennessee Titans. And I don't know what it would cost you. I absolutely not. I'm not. I'm not trading a first round pick. No. I'm not doing. I'm not trading a first round pick for anything. Whether it's to trade up in the draft, whether it's to trade for a player, I'm not trading that pick next year. It might cost you your second this year. I'm not doing that either. But I have to give Bolt Barnwell a lot of credit. Whenever he kind of does these breakdowns, whether it's with players or in the draft, he's usually pretty dialed in. Yeah. Like and. So that's why I would have to ask Bill Barnwell, okay, you think the Titans should trade up with what picks? Yeah. The Titans don't have enough picks. And I'm with you. It, with all of the Chargers offensive linemen chatter, mm -hmm. it feels way too intentional for me to buy that that's actually what their plan is. Mm -hmm. No coaches and no general managers are so upfront and obvious about what their draft plan is mm -hmm. unless that team has the number one overall pick. Yeah. Like we all know Chicago's taking Caleb Williams. Exactly. And that's fine. And we all it, can know that. Because it's not going to determine anybody else's pick. Yeah, nothing's going to yeah. change. We all know that they're going to take Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams will be a Chicago Bear and that's done. Like mm -hmm. we all know that. I, it, Jim Harbaugh's smarter than mm -hmm. saying, that, oh, we're going to take an offensive lineman. I'm excited to build the offensive line. You need a strong and in solid offensive line. I'm not going to let Jim Harbaugh's public comments about building the offensive line scare me into trading picks away mm -hmm. just so I can take a Joe Walt at left tackle. Even though I think Joe Walt, everything that I've heard, everything that I've read about Joe Walt, and you probably the same way, Denise, yeah. he seems... He's, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. It seems like he is just as good of a left tackle prospect of any of them. It seems that he is far and beyond the best left tackle or offensive lineman, for that matter, prospect in this year's draft. That it, Joe Alt feels like he would be a game-changing, franchise-altering kind of player if you can ha add him into the offensive line. Mm -hmm. I'm not trading up to get that, though. No. I'm sitting at seven at the very most. Mm -hmm. I'll let another player fall to me. I'll trade back and I'll take an Olaf Ashnew or a J.C. Latham or another tackle in this year's draft. I'm not desperate enough for that one specific player or, frankly, that one specific position yeah. to, to gamble away the rest of my picks in this year or other picks in this year's draft or future picks in next year's draft in order to do it. I just, I simply, I can't stomach that. You don't have enough picks, and you have far too many needs. Yeah, you, you're, you don't have the luxury of, of, of giving up draft picks 
to get that one player. Again, the Titans are not one player away. Um, they are several players away from putting themselves back in a position that they were in a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, now, are they, will they be able to do that this, you know, do via the draft? They did some of it uh, via free agency, but will they be able to complete uh, what they need to complete via the draft? Probably not. So if that's the case, I'm not giving up picks when I know I already have to build my team. The, as much as we have talked up the quarterback, we don't know a piece to guy, mm -hmm. you know? So you got to make sure you keep all of your picks in hand. Mm -hmm. Because to me, if you move up in a draft, that tells me that you had your eye on one person and one person only. I think that's a bad draft. And that's, exactly. So to me, it's like, I am going to stay put. Listen, if, if the L.A. Chargers want to draft all, damn it, but I'm not moving up to get it. Mm -hmm. I got to have contingency plans. I got to have plan A, plan B. Who's that next tackle? Um, and then who's the tackle uh, after him? Are the, is, that, is there that much of a gap between alt and the next tackle? Then is, that, is it that much of a gap between tackle number two and tackle number three? If it's not, then I am not... I am not mortgaging or giving up, you know, parts of my farm just to get one player. I'm not doing it. I, I can't do it. I simply couldn't stomach if it. If it's not a quarterback, I'm not doing it. If it's not a quarterback. Now, if they were a quarterback dire knee and they wanted to move up to get one of these quarterbacks, fine. Do what you need to do because mm -hmm. that will, if you, if you hit right, it will outlast any pick that you gave up. Mm -hmm. But that's only with a quarterback. I'm not doing it with any other player. But the fact that Bill Barnwell even brings this up, uh -huh. the, the idea of, one, the Titans' desperation for a left tackle, which we know is true. Like, the Titans are desperate for mm -hmm. a left tackle. And also zeroing in on one guy in a tackle draft that we've all been told is a fairly deep one. Mm -hmm. That you could find uh, a Patrick Paul in the second round with a 30th overall pick, and he could be a pretty solid tackle for yeah. you. Um, that leads me to believe, is Joe Alt really that much of is there really that much separation between Joe Alt and the rest of these tackles? Um, I don't know. And uh, I don't know I, the answer. I would to that love either. to find that find that out um, in regards to you know um, where does we obviously we know Joe Alt is the best left tackle mm -hmm. in this year's draft, but what separ what is the separation between he and the second guy? Mm -hmm. Whoever that second guy you deem to be, what is the separation? If, if the separation is, is not too much, then okay. You know, I don't mind if I miss it. Do I want Joel? Absolutely. But if I miss out on him because I'm not moving up to get him, then I feel comfortable with drafting that second guy, that third guy, knowing that I have one of the best offensive line coaches in the National Football League, if not the best. So I will lean on him in regards to where these guys ranked, how far apart are they. Now, O is ready-made for the NFL. Mm -hmm. He's probably the only person in this draft that is, they believe that is ready-made to just plug him in. He plays for the next 12 years, 12, 15 years, barring injury. That's he what everyone's it. been telling us. Exactly. So, you know, if I have an opportunity to get it at my pick, mm -hmm. I'm getting it. But I'm not moving up to get it. It would be – it's too much. It would be too much and you don't have enough to offer just exactly. to zero in on one singular player. You got too many other you got too many other issues on this team you to be too zeroing many in on one player that's not a quarterback. It feels like to me, now whatever the conversations are going on behind closed doors, whatever the draft room strategy is, we don't know mm -hmm. and we're not gonna know until draft night and even whatever happens on draft night, we don't know if that was plan A. We don't know if they had to defer to plan B or plan C or plan D or element OP. Mm -hmm. It feels like to me, though, just based off of everything we, that we've heard and discussions that we've had, it feels like plan A is Joe Alt at seven. Yeah. That if Joe Alt is there at seven, you take Joe Alt at seven. Mm -hmm. But what if he's not there? In this scenario that Bill Barnwell is talking about, if the Chargers do, in, if, if this isn't a smokescreen, if the Chargers do in fact take Joe Alt at five, it does kind of feel like plan B is, all right, well, Minnesota, what are you going to give us for seven? All right, well, Denver, what are you going to give us for seven? Feels like trading back could potentially even be as high of a, an option as plan B, at least in my opinion. Yeah, if, if, if old is not there or that, let's just say that guy you have tagged that, that would be your first round pick seventh overall. If he's not there, then 
how far down can you go and still feel that need on this team with a very good player? Mm -hmm. Is it to Minnesota? Is it to Denver? Do I, can I go a little bit further than Denver and still be able to pick up the guy that I want? That we won't know that question until draft day, um, but I, I'm sure that's something that that Rand Carthon and, and 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 the crew is have talked about. They had to have talked about it because again, all may be gone. Mm -hmm. Someone may trade with the L.A. Rams to move up. L.A. Rams may stay at that pick in in draft all. So if that does happen, what do we do now? It, it does feel like I'm just trying to fast forward to draft day and picture myself. <laughs> well, we got like doing three the weeks, show. somewhere around there. Three weeks. Yeah. We're almost there. I'm picturing myself on draft night. And if it's, you know, Roger Goodell gets up to the podium and it's the twinkly doo -doo 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 music. Mm -hmm. And he says with the fifth overall pick, the L.A. Chargers select Joe Alt. I can just feel myself going. <laughs> like a dagger to the heart, like, no, uh, <laughs> that was supposed to be our guy. <laughs> uh, all right, I want to get Tim Hasselbeck's thoughts on this. Uh, the philosophy of moving up, moving down, staying put in the draft, and especially with the tackle draft, that uh, the, the, the depth of this tackle draft. We'll catch up with Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst, coming up next. We'll also get into your thoughts on this as well. What do you think the Titans should do? Bill Barnwell on ESPN.com says he thinks the Titans should trade up to draft a tackle. With what picks is my question. I don't, I don't think that the Titans should be desperate enough to deal the very few picks that they have in this year's draft to get that one guy. But we'll get your thoughts on that coming up next as well. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace, we are brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889. Terms of one 800 889 Excuse me. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet.
plumbing, heating, and air conditioning game Nashville Studios, home of the $99 yearly Beehive membership where the buzz is always about great service. Today, our Game Nashville studio is Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena because the Predators take on the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Puck drop at 7 p.m. Preds win tonight, and they clinch the playoffs. Preds take it to OT tonight. They clinch the playoffs. So I'm going into this game saying, hey, can you just take care of business? Yeah, this, just, this, can, this, just get it over with. Can you ease our anxiety and just get it over with? Today? And I don't even have anxiety about it. I just, <laughs> I just want, like, I want Willie's anxiety exactly. to be eased. I want Predators fans' anxiety to be eased. We've been saying, D-Mace, we've been cool as cucumbers. Exactly, this we're good over here. We're it's, good. It's Willie. <laughs> Willie's been losing hair. Exactly. The so. hair that he has left. Um, so we'll catch up with Tim Hasselbeck here in, in just a couple of moments. Oh, and he joins us now, ESPN NFL analyst and Ensworth head coach, Tim Hasselbeck. Tim, appreciate you for joining us. We were just talking about an article put out by one of your colleagues at ESPN, Bill Barnwell, and he broke down every pick in every team, what they should do at that pick. Stay put, trade back, trade up, and Chicago Bears at one, stay put. I think we can all agree with that. With the Tennessee Titans, Bill Barnwell's thought was the Titans should trade up and take the, their tackle, per, perhaps trade up with the Arizona Cardinals to leapfrog the Chargers to take Joe Alt to ensure that they get their left tackle of choice. Just your evaluation of this draft and what the Titans have, the limited draft resources that the Titans have available. Do you think that's the best path? Well, um, Listen, I think getting the tackle that you want makes a lot of sense for what the current need is. It definitely feels to me like the momentum of, you know, where the Titans think they are at the moment at quarterback. Like, it really feels as though look, we drafted this quarterback, you know, Will Levis, um, you know, a year ago when he played. He ended up um, showing us enough that we feel like it makes the most sense to try to set him up for – you know, growth and development and success. And so when you look at that and you think about, you know, what we think will happen at receiver, what we think, you know, what we've seen them do at running back. Um, yeah. I, I think that offensive line makes the most sense. So look, I, I, you know, I think when Bill Barnwell, you know, kind of does, you know, columns like he does, he usually has a unique angle on things that, you know, sometimes can be a little bit different than, what everybody else is kind of singing in unison. Um, this one just feels like it makes the most sense, right? And look, I, I think you could make the argument the same thing, whether it's if we talk about the quarterbacks, Washington, go quarterback. In New England, uh, like I think it's a really hard argument to say, like, yeah, New England should trade out of that spot if um, they can get one of the top three quarterbacks. So, um, yeah, I think this is one of those scenarios where it just it kind of makes sense. Tim Hasselbeck is with us. We have heard so much coming out from the Chargers camp, from Jim Harbaugh, about the offensive line. Jim Harbaugh was so excited to build the offensive line, emphasize the importance of a strong offensive line. And look, he's not lying. I think that we would all agree that those things are important. But are you buying all of the offensive linemen to the Chargers buzz? Well, I, I think Harbaugh, whether it's a smokescreen or not, I think what he's saying is like, is is true like if you just look at his track record of where he's been the things that have mattered to him the guys that he's had coach with him you know people can say what they want about you know his time uh, you know with andrew luck but like they were running the heck out of the ball with toby gerhart back then uh and then you know when you think about his time at the niners like it was he and Greg Roman developing a bunch of different stuff. Like, like Frank Gore was the back, and then they had Colin Kaepernick in design run stuff that was giving people fits. Um, and then he gets to Michigan, and it's, you know, like throwback, you know, offenses in terms of what they're doing. So I don't just – I think he's wired in a way, former quarterback, sure, but he's wired in a way that is really – I think that there's a true belief from his perspective of – if you are really good up front, then you have a chance. And if you're not really good up front, then you don't. And, and so, like, could I see them in continuing to invest heavily in the offensive line year after year after year under his leadership? Absolutely, I could. You're right about that. Um, it, but it, it, it sort of, you know, I guess it would make um, Titans fans kind of 
you know, um, scared that you know, that that Harbaugh would take a tackle at the four or the five pick. Mm -hmm. I think they are what five. They pick number five. Five, yeah. yeah. Take a tackle at the fifth pick. But to me, I look at it as he's explaining, like you said, Tim, what all coaches want. You got to mm -hmm. build up your offensive line first in order to have a a you know, or in order to for me. You know, in order to have a complete team, you got to start with the offensive line, at least in my mind. Uh, where do you think this thing take a turn um, in the draft? Is it going to be the top four or five picks will possibly trade from the L.A. Chargers or, or, or Arizona? Because every year we go into the draft, um, there's a there's a turning point within the draft that sort of we thought it was going to go this way. But, oh, my goodness, now it's going that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that. There probably are a couple moments where, you know, we look at it and say, okay, it, um, like this could be a move at this point. So, look, I, I told you what I feel like New England should do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at New England, and, and I mean this, if you look at New England's offense right now, like how many guys on their starting offense do you look at and you say, yep, they would be a starter at any of the other AFC East teams. Like, I literally think it's, it's one or two guys. Maybe the center um, and maybe the tight end. I think outside of that, like, I don't know if they have another player on their starting offense that I think you can say, like, yep, he would be a starter at any of these other AFC East teams. Like, that's just in your, your division, never mind your conference. Like, so, you know, the, I bring all that up to say, Look, I think if, if Drake May was there, like, I would take him. But they may also just look at their situation and say, we have so many holes for an organization that was so stable for so long. Like, they are about as bad as you can look on offense right now. I mean, look at their – they have all kinds of issues and all kinds of holes. So that, that would be the first spot where I feel like it could change. Now, if they just say, look, we understand we've got a long way to go, but we're getting the quarterback because we're picking all the way up here, fine. So – so, so maybe it doesn't change at that point. Then I think that somewhere between, you know, this like Arizona Cardinals situation where if, if people feel like, you know, like the quarterback thing is going to continue to move, you know, I think we've talked before about like does Minnesota try to do something to get way up there or, you know, if, if Drake May wasn't a part of that. So like I think in that 3-4 range is – uh, is where something could really happen. And if it doesn't happen there, D Mace, then, then I think that it probably, you know, starts to happen, you know, maybe around the giants. Um, because if they're not going quarterback, you know, maybe somebody else is coming up to go quarterback. Now the neighbors, Malik neighbors, um, obviously, you know, teams are trying to figure out, you know, whether, is is it Marvin Harrison or is it Malik Neighbors? Which one of these guys? But now all of a sudden, uh, you know, things are starting to come out about Neighbors, and it's just ironic to me that you know you had you've had all this time to evaluate this player, and we know how the NFL is. They're going to dig up under every rock just about to try to find out if there's something in your background because when you're drafting that high, they want to make sure they have you know, all the T's uh, crossed and all the I's dotted. What do you make of this Malik Neighbors news? To me, I don't want to believe someone that just put it out there deliberately to either, you know, sway the way the draft is going or, or you know, push this young man further down um, in the first round. But it's just ironic again. It's ironic that all of a sudden now this stuff is coming out of bottom. Whereas before that, we didn't hear much of anything bad um, about Malik Neighbors. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, – look, I, I definitely think that, that guys get, you know, trashed to devalue them, to cause some type of um, hesitation from another team if they have prospects ranked um, closely. And so maybe you, maybe you link – leak information that's accurate but it's still harmful to the prospect um i would think that most teams are you know trusting their own research on all this stuff they've poured you know millions of dollars into their scouting departments to to gather the information so i would 
hope that we're kind of past the point where, um, you know, teams are, are just believing, you know, anonymous reporting. Um, all that to say, D. Mace, like, mm-hmm. I thought that his comments about going to New York uh-huh. would definitely raise my eyebrows a little bit to be like, hey, man, like, you can't say – Hey, yeah, like New York would be great if you get the quarterback situation figured out. You're going to need to feed me the ball. Like, when, when, one of, when one of your first five text messages is going to be from Daniel Jones, like, like that's awkward. So, yeah, look, I, I think sometimes where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, I think most teams probably know it already even before it comes into a report. We're talking with Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst and head coach at the Android, um Tigers. Um, now, we've talked so much, Tim, about the top three quarterbacks and even the top four when you add J.J. McCarthy in there. What about the other quarterbacks? What about the Michael, um, mm-hmm. Michael Penix or the Bo Nix quarterbacks mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. we saw put up big numbers, play big all this year, but they, it seems like they are being forgotten amongst the other three or four at the top of the, uh, at the, top of the pile? Yeah, and I think that – I just take them individually. I think the big thing for uh, Michael Penix um, is his injury history. I mean, it's really, I think it's that simple. If he were to be, um, you know, have a clean injury history, then I then I think that that would look totally different for him. You know, between his his frame um, and ability to hold up, that's a concern because he's a really remarkable passer. So, in his production was good at various stops. And so, you know, he was good at Indiana and then he was good at at UW. And so um, I think that's the thing that is hurting uh, Penix. And look, that's part of how this works, that that one makes sense. You know, on Bo Nix, I think his is a little bit interesting because, you know, if if you were to group him into like the J.J. McCarthy mix, Mm -hmm. here's what I would say. You know, Bo Nix um, played early at a school that plays in a tough conference and had a lot of pressure on him. And for the most part, I think responded well to the pressure and really kind of got run out of town unfairly, I I believe. Then, you know, makes the move to Oregon and plays great and, and produces at a high level. And he's a, I think a better athlete than people realize I think as a passer, he's had moments where he just hadn't been super accurate. And he's, you know, there are games where you kind of question some decision making. But I think you can say all those same things for J.J. McCarthy. I think both those guys are, are both battle tested. They had to, to earn the jobs that they had in college. Um, and, I, and so I think there's a lot to like about that uh, for Bo Nix. So, um, look, I, I would probably have him after McCarthy. Um, but I think that he's another really good prospect, just like I think Michael Penix is a good prospect. Uh, but because of, you know, varying things, yeah, they're just kind of out of that top mix. Now, Tim, do you think uh, – how far do you think one of these quarterbacks would, would drop? Because I'm looking at it from this standpoint, and I know the Titans don't need uh, a backup quarterback as we sit now. Um, but drafting one of these guys, if indeed they do fall fifth round, somewhere around there, because you're not – listen, you have a backup in Mason Rudolph, but, I mean, is he going to be here after this season? Possibly not. And then you have um, Malik Willis, who we don't know anything about really um, because we don't know if he's gotten better or not. If a quarterback is sitting there that you thought was ranked higher – do the, should the Titans draft a quarterback if it's one of these guys that produce high in, in, in college, but for whatever reason, whether it be injury or something else, fail in the draft? My, my answer is this, Kirk Cousins. Yes, like absolutely. Like if you have somebody, if you have a grade on somebody and it's not a position in need, and then you look up at the board and you're like, man, we're, we're in the fourth round, we're in the fifth round, and that guy is available, and we think he's a really good player, especially at you know the quarterback position. Yes, absolutely draft him. Look, I, I, it's not a foregone conclusion. That, and and look, in fairness, like that's probably what they did with Malik Willis. Yeah. Um, probably what they did with Will Levis. So, um, yeah. I and and 
I'll just say this. Like, when Mason Rudolph was coming out, mm-hmm. I thought he easily could have been a first-round draft pick from his college tape, his size. I thought he was the best deep ball thrower in that, that, that draft when he was coming out. Like, I think there were a lot of things to like about, um, about Mason Rudolph. So, and he's played some good football in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So I do think it's fine for all these teams to be in the mix. Now, I would say, I don't know how, if things kind of go the way that people think they're going to go, like, I don't know how at 11 Minnesota doesn't draft a quarterback. I really don't. And then, and then the, the Broncos are in a very similar situation right after them. So I do think there'll be a run of quarterbacks. I do think some of these guys will slip into round two. And then when that happens, It'll push the, that, that next wave of guys even further down. Um, but I do think quarterbacks are going to go early, and it maybe just doesn't end up being the year where somebody, um, you know, falls to the fifth round or something like that. We're talking with the ESPN NFL analyst Tim Hasselbeck. Tim, sticking along the theme of quarterbacks, how have you evaluated Joe Milton as an NFL prospect? Yeah, yeah this one's super hard, I think, because <laughs> – He's a fascinating you know, one. I mean, it's so fascinating. Like he, um, like if he just had normal physical talent, then I think he might not have a draftable grade. Mm. Um, but that's not the case. He has remarkable physical. Like he may be the closest thing to Anthony Richardson that which is weird year after year, but he just, he might be the closest thing to Anthony Richardson physically. Um, So I think that ends up being the challenge with him is that he is so supremely gifted, but the production and the consistency and honestly, just the number of uh, quality opportunities that you've seen from him um, just weren't there. And so with that, like, it's just, it's such a projection, you know? And um, like, I feel some ways that like this happens sometimes that like Logan Thomas, I think that's his name. Logan Thomas played quarterback at Virginia tech. And he got drafted as a quarterback by Bruce Arians, but Bruce Arians, I think saw him as potentially a quarterback mm-hmm. and not potentially. I mean, as a quarterback, that's how they drafted him. And then it just, like it was clear it was like you know what like no this is why it just went the way that it it went for you as a quarterback at Virginia Tech and he's had a nice career as a tight end I'm not saying that that Joe Milton should be playing another position but I, I I think that Joe Milton will get drafted because he's a remarkable thrower of the football he you know has played quarterback he has had some success but it is such a projection and but I think someone's willing to take the risk on him. And then what his NFL future looks like, I think is way up in the air to be determined. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see his career kind of pan out. Last one for you, Tim, quickly before you get you out of here. The Titans' first day of the offseason started yesterday. We're less than a month removed from voluntary minicamp. What should Will Levis be doing right now in this stage of the offseason? Yeah, I think totally asserting himself. Like, here's this window of time where you for sure know, like, you're the guy. Like, you, like, they are setting everything up for you to be the guy. Could there be some crazy surprise that, you know, they draft a quarterback? Maybe. But, like, I doubt that that happens. And so, like, behave as if you know it's not going to happen. Like, take such a leadership position and asserting yourself of being the guy, being the the starting quarterback for the Tennessee Titans and having everything be built around you. Like, go ahead and, like, like put that stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. And so how you talk, how you you kind of how you carry yourself, uh, how you interact with your other teammates, how you how you are in the building, how you are with the new coaching staff, like, leave no doubt that you believe that you are the guy going forward. Like, I think by doing that, in, in creating a belief from everybody else in you, like that goes a long way. And, and that would be my recommendation to him at this point. Tim, you are the very best. Appreciate your time today. And we'll catch up with you next week. Sounds good. See you guys. 
appreciate yep. it, Tim. Tim Hasselbeck, ESPN NFL analyst. Always appreciate his insight. We'll react to what he had to say coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mays, 102.5, 106.3 The Game. Score big this spring with Lee Company and the Nashville Predators in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 toward Lee Company Home Services. That's right, a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 toward Lee Company Home Services. So go online to leecompany.com slash giveaway to enter. That's leecompany.com slash giveaway in the 10K Power Play giveaway. Contest entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th. Lee Company, all you need. Appreciate Tim Hasselbeck for stopping by in the last segment. Dimes, I asked him about the, the trade-up scenario in order, in order to get Joe Alt to leapfrog the Chargers. And Tim said, yeah, he'd do it. You changed your mind at all? No, I still hadn't changed my mind. <laughs> um, you know, uh, obviously Tim has his reasons for saying that, and he explained them. But to me, it it's still because we where we are at as a team. 
I can't afford to give up picks and still try to build a winning team. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say, well, I can wait until – no, I can't wait until next year. No. We need to build the team. You are in a perfect spot that – I think that, that, that sixth and that seventh spots are really good spots because – especially in a draft like this, because even if you possibly miss out on your first guy – you're still able to possibly get your second guy and still, um, you know, plug that guy. He's ready. He's a plug-and-play type of guy. You still can do that. Now, once you get, you know, outside of that, that 10, it's a little bit harder to get that guy. Um, but when you're in that sweet spot, six, seven, five, six, seven, why trade up? Why trade down unless, you know, you still believe you can get your guy you want at, say, pick 12 mm -hmm. or 13? Any further than that, I think you are running a risk of not getting who you deem to be maybe the top two or three guys at a position of need, which is tackle, or the top two or three guys at defensive end on the defensive side of the ball, um, on the defensive line. So to me, you can only go, you can only go so far back, um, but I wouldn't go up because going up means I got to give up picks and more than likely it's either going to be a first or a second round pick but it's going to be multiple picks yeah i'm not giving up a first if that's the asking yeah. price i hang up the phone uh -huh. monty Austin for <laughs> listen to my dial tone because I'm, I'm not giving up a first if the titans go into this draft with the mindset of joe alt no matter what i think that's really dangerous yeah. and i understand it and everything that we've heard makes him sound like the perfect prospect on the field and off the field. You can plug him in right now and get coached up by the best offensive line coach in the NFL. Like, it really does sound too good to be true. And it really does sound like it solves so many of your problems and so many of your questions about this team are now answered because you've solidified that left tackle position. But still, I just, I can't, and I, I understand the perspective of do whatever it takes to get the tackle that you want, but I still just can't, fathom and I just still can't swallow the idea of giving up let's say your second in this year's draft which could potentially be your replacement for mm -hmm. Danico Autry or in addition to this wide receiver room or something else in addition at a position of need or to bolster up positions that you've already supplemented in free agency I just I can't get on board with that yeah it's going to be tough but I, I consider um alt a one of those for, force multipliers mm -hmm. because to me you get him, his position will be locked down, but he will make your guard better mm -hmm. and he will make your center better. So to me, you know, if you can get a guy like that, get him, but I wouldn't trade the world to get him. You hope that he falls down to you. I believe he will fall to them. Um, but if he's not there, then you move on to your next guy. Mm -hmm. um, and whoever you get, you know, to fill that role, I think at this point of the draft, meaning the top, you know, 13, 14, you're still able to get a tackle that can be a, a force multiplier as well, that can help out your guard as well as your ta um, center. All right, coming up next, Cal is headed to Arkansas, which is still something that I, I just cannot <laughs> wrap my, my mind around. Is Kentucky shortlist getting even shorter day by day of their Cal replacement? We'll get into that coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mace, live out of here at Bridgestone Arena, 1025, 1063, the game. Let's talk about Zen Sports, people. And I've been telling you this for the last three months, I believe. It's been somewhere around there, but I've been telling you about Zen Sports, the new sports book in Tennessee that brings sports betting to a whole new level. And I mean that literally. When you sign up for Zen Sports, you'll automatically earn up to $1,000, no danger, first wager. If your first bet loses, you'll be reimbursed for the amount of your bet up to $1,000. Zen Sports offer true odds on all parlays and boosted same game parlays for all Tennessee sports team. That means boosted up to 20% over other books in Tennessee. And there's even more good news. Zen Sports offer a one-of-a-kind VIP reward program. If you qualify, you'll earn monthly comps or sporting events, concerts, you name it, even sport book bonuses. The VIP program is by invite only, people. So if you feel that your Zen Sports Play qualifies for the VIP 
consideration. Check out the program details and apply at zensports.com slash VIP. So what are you waiting for, people? The, the daily same game parlay boost go quick. So get going and download their app at zensports.com today. That's Zen Sports, where betting just got better. And remember, gambling problems call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. No danger wager limits to 5 Two plus 500 odds to qualify. Boosted odds are derived from equivalent parlay bets offered in Tennessee, but you must be 21 years or older to bet here in Tennessee.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 1025-1063, The Game and The Game Nashville app. We are streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. We are live from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios, home of the $99 yearly Beehive membership where the buzz is always about great service. Today, the studio is Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena because the Predators are hosting the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Puck drop at 7 o'clock, pregame with Max Herz starting at 6 p.m. One more point and you officially clinch. Willie D joins the party now. Willie, how we doing? Hey, guys. I'm doing well. I, I am, I'm running on adrenaline right now. It is Are been, you? Uh, yeah, it has been busy. So okay. we had the Saturday-Sunday uh -huh. uh, trip up to New York, so back-to-backs there. Then I had a double, a twinite doubleheader mm -hmm. last night for the USN Tigers. Unfortunately, got swept by a really good team, Middle Tennessee Christian School, uh, one of the best teams in the district. Uh, but a lot of baseball. Then I got home and I was like, I gotta watch the, gotta the watch UConn the game. game. So I had it taped. I, I successfully. Now you tell me how tough this is do, to do these days. I successfully made it through two high school baseball games without a fan or a parent Somebody tell or a family score? telling me what the score was. I kept oh, telling wow. everybody, "Do not tell me. <laughs> do not tell me what happened." And of course, after the game ends and we're driving home from Murfreesboro, uh -huh. everybody's like. My son was like, Dad, you sure you don't want to know who won the game? I was like, no, do not tell me. Do not tell me. Like, you're really going to really turn it on? Like, it, it, was, it was a lot of baseball. So uh -huh. I didn't start watching until it was like close to 11 o'clock. Uh -huh. But, you know, you can zip through you zip quick. Through the through those commercials that, yeah. are so long in those games now. Yeah. Those TV timeouts take forever. So I kind of liked being able to skip that. But uh -huh. I did it. I did it. So I didn't uh -huh. know. Oh, okay. That's awfully That's impressive. hard to that do. That's tough. Yeah. That is hard to do. In this day and age, yeah, usually yeah, exactly. somebody spills the beans, right? Yeah. Somebody just spills if, the beans. Even if you're just like, okay, you run into the convenience store and somebody says, yes, Kentucky and <laughs> yeah. UConn. You're like, oh. <laughs> no, 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 damn it, damn it. Don't tell I, me. I missed like the first two minutes of the second half. I had it paused. I was out running errands. So I was like, okay, geez, that's just two minutes. And then, of course, I by habit open up Twitter on my phone and I'm like, dang it. Mm -mm. Two minutes. All <laughs> yeah. I needed was two minutes and I already spoiled it for myself. Um, I do want to get into that, some of our reaction to UConn's back-to-back -back national championships, not just beating Purdue, whooping some Purdue butt last night. And really, two straight tournaments, whooping everybody's butt. Like, there's yeah. not a single, like, you think of these great moments in March, the buzzer beaters or the, the great upsets. Nah. UConn has not had a game that has been close. No. Really, in they've two NCAA everybody. tournaments. Yeah, they've dominated everybody. That's, that's no fun. I, I think it's I fun, saw for you <laughs> fun for UConn. Fun for UConn. I saw a stat that UConn has beaten every single team that they faced in the tournament by double digits. Yeah, yeah I think absurd. that's right. Like, it's not, and it's not like a pull away at the very, very end. Some, most of them have been in the bag yeah. with five minutes to go. Yeah. Right. It has just been sheer and utter domination from UConn. And I think that there's kind of two different ways that you can look at it. I think some basketball fans, Joe Rexford included, love it. And then I think there's a faction of the of college foot or excuse me, college basketball fans or just sports fans in general that are like, Yeah, but I'd like to see a little bit more parody. I'd like to see a nail biter. I'd like to see it come down to the end when it's oh my gosh, I can't believe they fouled them in the final seven seconds. Like You're what right. we saw from the Iowa UConn game. Oh, yeah. One call in the final few seconds of the game it completely changed how we viewed kind of the outcome so it was a I, I said this earlier i think it was a good game it wasn't a great game it was zach Eady and then everybody else and then yukon's just beautiful fluid ballet on the hardwood kind of offense and so confident so every confident. guy is like I i'll take the shot oh, you know like the, I yeah. i'll take it oh oh it's your but but they work together. They yeah. don't hog the ball. But it's like, okay, you want to take this tough shot? Fine. It seems like they just never run out of people who could make a play. It's just waves of, of people waves. coming in. Mm. Just off the bench. I think they even brought a player out of stands. I um, think they did. The tuba <laughs> player. <laughs> exactly. He hit a three. <laughs> or she hit uh, a three. Oh, man. But th the other thing I thought was the key was Zach Eady got his, right? Mm. He had 37 points or whatever. He played great. Like, he was inspired and he was battling. Mm. And it was fun to watch those two oh, big guys was. go at it. They made it tough on him, uh -huh. but he got his points. But they took everybody else yeah. away. Like, they could even get a three-point shot off. Mm -hmm. Like, what, there was a stat towards the end of the first half where I think Purdue was like 0 for 1 uh -huh. from three. Like, they that was – they, they, were, they were saying, as a, as a game plan, mm -hmm. 
we're running you off the three-point line. You can throw it into Zach Eady. They didn't double Zach Eady. Right. They we're did. gonna and that, Tennessee tried problem. that. Exactly. Tennessee tried it, and it was fairly successful for them, mm-hmm. right? But UConn just did it better. They yeah. just did it better. UConn did it, but, I mean, Zach Eady still got his. He had yeah. 37, 37 points, points last yeah. night. Yeah. And I saw a lot of Tennessee fans complaining on Twitter, like, oh, you know, if we just shut down Zach Eady like UConn did. Like, I'm sorry, they didn't, they didn't shut, shut Zach Eady no. down. <laughs> Zach Eady scored 41 against Tennessee and 37 against UConn. It wasn't yeah. the Zach Eady story, in my opinion. I think the difference was, well, against Tennessee, they had one guy scoring points, mm-hmm. and for UConn, all of the love was spread around that you had several different players with double digit points. Tennessee just couldn't get things moving offensively and UConn combined with, you know, trying to put big man on big man Mm -hmm. and limiting what other Purdue players could do. It was also UConn was just scoring. Like UConn was just doing what they wanted to do and executing their offensive game plan. So now you wonder, and I guess uh, Dan Hurley, did somebody ask him about the Kentucky job? Yeah, he ain't going nowhere. Dan he's like, uh, excuse nowhere. me? Like, yeah. I've just won two championships. Yeah. Like, he was like, why, why are you even asking? Exactly. Well, we do I have that, know. Nick, if you have it handy. We do have Dan Hurley being asked about the Kentucky job. And it was such a Dan Hurley-esque response because he's such he's, a – He's a piece yeah. of work. He's a yeah, zany yeah. little character. Yeah. Um, he needs to chill on the sideline a little bit, yeah. really. Like – He's I love it as a coach, man. He's, he's but wired. He, but, but every call yeah, I know. is not a But he's, like, work, he's really working the refs. That's all. Because right. you remember the second half, you didn't see any of that. Second half, he sort of calmed down. But the first half. I'm not half, sure he calmed down. I don't he think was the cameras in, were he on was, him. He was in, like, on the ref's hip. I mean, he you know, pushed every, his own exactly, player with yeah. his ball in his hands. Yeah, he was into it. He wanted to be out there in some shorts in, now, some, in some converse. And he <laughs> might. It's, it's, a, it's, a tough, it's a tough battle between him and Bobby Hurley, who's crazier on the sideline. Yeah. They're both Ooh. crazy. They go nuts on the refs every call. It's like, guys, not every call is controversial. They're just, just working relax. the refs. Pick They're working spot. the refs. They work I like those it. refs. I it's like old it. school. They work the refs, It is man. old school. And watching the game last night and just kind of the overall conversation, I was having this conversation last night as the game was on. And I made the point of, and DMAC, you and I were talking uh-huh. about this before the games on, on Friday, before the games over the weekend, I just felt like there was so much more draw, so much more intrigue on the women's mm-hmm. side of the tournament. I heard Joe Rexrode today, who loves college basketball. He said he thought it was a fantastic tournament. And he was going on and on about, you know, Tennessee and UConn. If they would have faced in the national championship game, how could things have been what different? What a coulda, shoulda. Yes, of course. But I wanted to get your perspective because my thought was I thought the women's tournament was much more engaging, was much more exciting, and it was much more must-see TV from me. But from your perspective, how exciting do you think this men's tournament was? I thought it was exciting. I thought it had its moments. Um, You know, whether it's UConn going down, whether it's Carolina losing, um, you know, the, the, the run that NC State made. Um, hell, the run that Alabama made as well. Um, you know, not many people talking about um, UConn because probably they didn't think that this year they could, you know, repeat as champions. Not that they were not good, um, but I think a lot of people had Purdue winning it uh, because of Zach Eady. Um, so there were moments in the men's um, tournament, but I think personality overtake moments personalities were on the women's side. You had a bunch of personality, a bunch of really good, awesome, great players. And in the men's basketball, you really didn't have that. To me, it was more so, it, well, you, you had Burns and him going up against Zach Eady and what DJ Burns was able to do. But besides DJ Burns, kid out of Oakland, I mean, there was not many, like, Guys that you just, like, fell in love with, like, oh, man, I got to watch this. Yeah. Well, on the women's side, you had a bunch of women that you just fell in love with their play, and you wanted to watch it. And even the Jack Golke story, I felt like got old yeah. after exactly the, the Sweet 16, probably after they lost to Oh, NC yeah, State. you probably forgot his yeah. name. Yeah. Exactly. And someday you'll go back and say, who was the guy that hit all threes <laughs> against Kentucky? Remember that guy? And that'll be a good trivia question. Yeah. But, like, the women's game just has those – when you have stars coming back exactly. for two, three, four years or teams coming back with a lot of the same players, that is what really gets you going, I mm-hmm. think. That's what separates the women's game right now. 
The men's game is still – there's so many transfers. There's so many new faces. Zach Eady is maybe the exception, right, a guy who was at the same school for a long time, got his. That was a, that was a really good story. But Dalton Connect one year yeah. at, at Tennessee was the story. UConn's got a lot of different guys this year than they had last year. It's a mix, right? They didn't have, like, all the same – like, Florida, the last back-to-back team, mm-hmm. it was the same five guys two yeah. years in a row. Yeah. Like, that was a great story. They all decided to stay and come back for that one more year and won it again. That was a great story. So we remember all those guys. But UConn's a little different. The UConn college game is just – It's just such NBA a free year. flow. Yeah, it's just such a free flow in and out of programs bouncing around. That's the problem. I do think the product – when I watch the games, has improved some. Yeah. It was a little – it was getting really ugly. There were too many games with the 30-second shot clock and moving the three-point shot back mm-hmm. where I felt like there was too many grinders, 54, 51 kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm like, we got to open it up. I felt like it was a better game to watch this year. So I thought it was a good season of college basketball. I still think – and the fact that it's an older game, it's a more mature game, has added a layer – you can't just out-talent the other team. There's something about team building mm-hmm. with, with that balance that we talked about a lot, with the, what, what Rick Barnes is doing as opposed to what John Calipari is doing. <laughs> it's an evolving thing. Mm-hmm. And so that adds some intrigue. But I, I still would like to see a little more continuity. Guys stay a little more. I'm hoping the cycle will s- settle down a little bit. And like, dude, it doesn't, you don't have to change schools every two years. You don't need to go to right. four schools. I mean, Stay in one spot, stick it out, ride it out. Yeah, You'll benefit from it. They, these kids, I mean, when they're not playing, they want to jump ship I know. and transfer. Um, I think to me, again, um, obviously I think the women's side had more personalities, um, you know, more individual players that you really wanted to watch. And obviously South Carolina just had their whole team. Yeah. Um, I think in the men's side it was, it was more about teams, rather than players Mm -hmm. um we didn't i don't think we looked at this year's tournament like we did last year's tournaments when we were you know looking at the kid out of alabama you know um, and that was really more of an exactly because of what happened yeah rather than yeah Yeah, but he was a he was a he was a marquee player yeah even before all of that happened so we had individuals zach Eady getting his first you know uh naismith award and and, and and people believing that you know because of the big fella Purdue was going to win the championship yeah. I think there were more individuals that you wanted to follow last year as opposed of this year uh, on the men's side and then you compare that to the women there were more individual women mm-hmm. that you wanted to follow and see how they were doing rather than the team because to me without Caitlin Clark nobody's watching Iowa Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Um, I was probably not even close to that stage. Exactly. Yeah. We're not getting to back-to-back national champions Absolutely. without the without best player SC, on the planet. Without sure. S, yeah. without Juju, how many people are watching SC? Even though they have a good team, you know. So they didn't have. They had the individuals. I thought men's basketball had more of the teams, and but we're so caught up on individuals now that that's why we're watching. Everybody watch. Why? Not because of Iowa. Because of Kate, Caitlin Clark mm-hmm. or Angie Reese, and, um, you know, or Juju uh, Watkins or Paige Becker. We're watching to see them, not their team. And that's a good point, too, because the primary story in women's college basketball was Caitlin Clark. Mm-hmm. I think maybe the secondary story would be, you know, LSU and the fire that they bring and Kim Mulkey and how much, you know, baggage she carries. Like, the tertiary conversation, at best, mm-hmm. was South Carolina's dominance and the fact that they had a perfect yeah. season and went undefeated. Like, and that, that wasn't even a huge story. No, that was really, like, kind of a, oh, yeah, by the way, we're watching a historic run mm-hmm. from a coach that's about to enter territory of the greatest to ever do it with Pat Summit and Gino Ariema and Kim Mulkey and winning three-plus national championships. So I think that's a fair point. And I, I think the people overall – just fall in love with storylines. Mm-hmm. People fall in love with individuals. People fall in love with good players mm-hmm. more so than good teams. Because, like, when it came to the men's side, like, we're talking about UConn because they just won the national championship, but they uh-huh. weren't really a fun story to talk about because no. they were just beating <laughs> <It's> everybody. <yeah. laughs> so, I, and 
And Do- I don't dominance really go from is there. appreciated, but on a nightly basis, yeah. it's not always much w- must watch. It gets you're like, tiring. Well, they're going to kill these guys. So yeah, they're going to dominate. Why they're going to dominate. This? I'm not. Yeah. I don't need to watch. I'll just wait. Mm-hmm. So they don't get the spotlight night in and night out sometimes because they're just not challenged. And I think it's different on the football side of things because in college you play 12 games a year. Yeah. In the NFL you play 17 regular season games. That when you have so few opportunities to be able to witness greatness, whether it's a singular player or a team as a whole, you take that and you eat that up with basketball when you're playing as many games as they are and the tournament is as long as it is. It's like, oh, UConn beat Nowheresville State University by 47 points. Okay, cool. But, like, what did Kim Mulkey say? Yes, like, exactly. that is kind of the, the draw here. I think that women's college basketball right now is the best bas- basketball product out there. I think it's better than the NBA. I think it's better than men's college basketball. And it's, it's certainly better than the WNBA. I don't think that's a product that really has caught on with the greater public. I think that's kind of a testament to what people appreciate in sports, and specifically in basketball. It's great players, it's personalities, and it's storylines that you fall in love with. I, would, I haven't seen the viewership from last I think night. It was like, what, the men's side? Yeah. I don't know. What I, I'm like assuming yet. because it was on only TNT. TNT, and, true. And the and mix, and the mix yeah. of how, I don't know how they did it on the different things, but as opposed to ABC, I, I'll guarantee you that the women's audience was way bigger. Of right? course. Women, women yeah. was 18.7, 18. 18. which yeah. was yeah. the largest basketball audience, period, yeah. on ESPN, NBA, men's, so on and so forth, since 2019. So I would venture to guess the men's side is probably hovering around half of that, 10 million, give yeah, or take. Yeah, you got to, because everybody doesn't have the channel. Um, 9.30 Eastern. 9.30 is late. Yeah. Um, so I still don't like that they don't put the final on CBS. Yeah. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's it what never I said has. Last Same night. thing with the World Series. And, it, it, you know, they've done it in the NBA Finals sometimes, yeah. have it on ESPN. I, I think it should be on free TV, the, the ones that are the biggest mm-hmm. games. World Series, NBA Finals, Stanley Cup Finals. I think all of those should be on network TV. Mm-hmm. But the, yeah. this is a different day and time. But – when it is like like the women's game, you get an extra, you get an extra viewership. Oh yeah, you're you're gonna get the viewership. Um, I, I I think women's basketball is in a good place right now. Um, I don't think it will because I, I look at it from this, from this standpoint on a regular Tuesday or Wednesday or Saturday, are people watching women's basketball? That's how I'm not I'm not taking March Madness because. You, you should have known people are going to watch Matt, March Madness, especially once it got down to the top eight teams mm-hmm. in women's basketball and in men, men's basketball for that matter. People are going to watch more. And then you start to see the storyline. So now, even if I'm not a basketball lover, mm-hmm. I'm going to watch because I want to watch these matchups, these two matchups. So this individual, um, Paige playing against – um, Caitlin, mm-hmm. I want to watch that. So it brings you in. But on an everyday basis during the season, women's basketball can't touch men's basketball. It can't touch the NBA. But during March, it's going to – it surpassed it mm-hmm. because it was more exciting. Because now once you get down to the cream of the crop teams, it becomes more exciting. It wasn't that exciting even with the cream of the crop teams, even though we only had two – of the possible, what, four number one teams in, 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 in the finals. But this year, it wasn't like it was in previous years. Like, it was like, like you said, do I want to watch UConn play against Purdue? Like, really? Like, okay, the big, the big fellas are going to do what they need to do. But for the most part, UConn's going to blow them out. That's the way you thought of it. UConn's going to blow and them out. And that's a shame because while, those were the two best teams of the exactly, year. It just shows you how good UConn exactly, was. Exactly, but yeah. it wasn't yeah. exciting. The women's side was exciting. Mm-hmm. The women's Final Four or Elite Eight was much more exciting than the men's were. But if you ask me to take it outside of the scope of the tournament, Women's basketball, unfortunately, it falls behind those other sports. Is it a popular? Is it more popular? Yes, it is. It's more popular. But if you're talking about watching every day, people are not watching every day. People, people barely watch-, watch men's college basketball every day or the NBA every day. So I'm sure when women's come on, the women's game come on a, a, a Monday or Tuesday, whenever it comes on Saturday, 
the viewerships are not what they were during the tournament. Nowhere near. I it. think that's that's probably uh -huh. across the board. For yeah, every exactly. Sport, every sport. Yeah. Regular season versus postseason. Exactly. Like, am I gonna watch a regular season? You know, Tampa Bay Buccaneers against, you know. Eagles, probably not, mm -mm. honestly. But if it's in the wild card round of the playoffs, oh, like, oh, yeah, it. oh, yeah, pop me some popcorn. Um, all right, I do want to com continue this conversation because we've got a bunch of thoughts on this. But I do want to touch on the Kentucky coaching search because we threw out a bunch of names yesterday. Are those names even on the table? What names are on the table for this Kentucky coaching search? We'll get into that coming up next. We'll also get into your thoughts as well. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, we're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. Let's talk and let's tell you about what I'm supposed to tell you about. And that is Lone Pronto. And these guys have been helping people out for a good while. You know the formula that I've been telling you about. That means if you're a homeowner in our listing area, your home's value is likely to be very, very high right now. And that means you have home equity stored up. And if you are in need of cash, you can use that home equity towards a better financial situation and it can be done quick that's the biggest thing about loan pronto they have a great system why should you use loan pronto because they have the express equity line of credit program that is an ai based system you can get approval in about 10 minutes in a lot of cases no documentation you know with a, just a few exceptions no appraisal in most cases and no hassle so it's a quick smooth process and you'll have that cash ready to go to pay bills, or to start a home improvement project. Whatever you might need it for, it's there for you. So call Loan Pronto now and find out more because you can use that value to wipe out those credit card bills. Thousands of dollars are at your fingertips. Call now, 615-499-5780. That's 615-499-5780. Or go to LoanPronto.com. NMLS 166-1781, subject to lender approval, equal housing lender.
Dan, I, I hope I don't misquote you, but you said out on the court something about UConn giving you all the resources you need. Um, can we interpret that to mean you intend to be back at UConn next year? You're not going to entertain any conversations <laughs> with anybody else that might have a job coming open tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think that's a concern. <laughs> you know, my wife, uh, you should have her answer that. <laughs> yeah. We can maybe arrange a press conference for Mrs. Hurley in the morning. Congratulations, Coach. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she'll, she'll answer that question better than I can. That was Dana Hurley after UConn took their second national championship in as many years. And I knew that as soon as the news broke that John Calipari was headed to Arkansas, I thought that's probably going to be, what, the first question that Dana Hurley is asked exactly. after he wins a national championship. Um, and, of course, it was asked, you know, it's, are you going to be in the talks with Kentucky? Should UConn fans be worried of you leaving UConn to go to Kentucky? And he said, ask my wife about it. And then I saw kind of a follow-up reporter said that uh, his wife would probably file for divorce if they were <laughs> headed to Kentucky. And I don't think that that's necessarily what Dan Hurley wants. So it sounds like Dan Hurley to Kentucky is not going to come to fruition. Nate Oates, Alabama head basketball coach, released a statement on Twitter yesterday, said, Bama Nation, I am fully committed to this team and to this university. We've already accomplished some great things here, and there is nothing I want more than for the University of Alabama to win its first national championship in men's basketball. Despite any rumors to the contrary, rest assured that I will continue that pursuit as your head coach. Roll Tide. Jay Wright came out and said, I'm not coming out of retirement. Those are three coaches that we mentioned yesterday that could be in consideration to fill the Kentucky vacancy that I, and all I, sound off, off the table. Yeah, I, and I never really had a feeling mm -hmm. that that's the guy it with any, of, or, any of those three. Oh, okay. Any of those yeah. three. I, I thought those were all long shots. I, unless yeah. Nate Oates was like, I want to be the coach at Kentucky. I, and he's just, we have our answer. Mm -hmm. So now we get to the, you know, who, who is it? Mm -hmm. You know, who, who will say, yeah. That's the guy I want to succeed. Because you made this point yesterday, Jimmy, yeah. is sometimes you don't always want to be the next guy yes. yeah. after John Calipari. You want to yeah. be the guy after the, guy, the next guy crashes and burns. Exactly. And Calipari was that way. Um, yeah, you know, Billy Gillespie. Exactly. He, he, there he crashed and people. burned. Exactly. But this is just him. That Before, guy got eaten up. Exactly. Before Calipari got there. Um, you know, to me, okay, this is the question that needs to be asked because – we're, we're talking about these, these great um, and even Hall of Fame coaches when you talk about Jay Wright um, and even Billy Donovan. Um, the question that you need to ask, because it's like, okay, Dan Hurley is like, uh, uh, nah, really, like, I ain't going. Why would he leave? Exactly. Why would I leave? This is a true blue blood right here, UConn. Big East, mm -hmm. old school, Willie, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. This is a true blue blood. Why would you leave? at the height of your success, or at least you're, trend, you're trending up, why would you leave and go take Kentucky job? But here's the question. Is Kentucky, Kentucky? Is that job still a marquee job? It's still Kentucky. I, I think it is. I, I, I'm, I'm not, if, if it was that way, why are these other coaches are like, nah, I ain't go, I, I'm staying put right here. I think because When you talk about Nate Odom or, 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 or Hurley, Jay Wright's not coming out of um, not coming out of retirement. Um, Billy Donovan's not leaving the NBA. I'm not sure if Kentucky. I'm not saying Kentucky's not good. That's not what I'm saying. I I think Kentucky is 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 going to be a a good team. Whoever they hire, unless they just you know hire some guy that don't know what he's doing. But is it Billy Gillespie? Yeah, was kind of but like, is I, it the Kentucky that we believe it is? Is it still that job? Why do you believe it's not? Because there are other, because, because the landscape has changed in college basketball. It's no longer, you know, we're going to get, because Kentucky has proven, yeah, we can go get the five-star guys. Well, at least Calipari proved that he can go get the five-star five, um, guys. Now that Calipari's gone, are they going there? You got to ask yourself, now all, all of these five-star guys, Will they go to Kentucky now that Calipari's not there? I'm not saying they're going to Arkansas either, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying I think the draw was Calipari, not necessarily the University of Kentucky. They haven't won a championship in damn near, what, a, over a decade. Mm -hmm. 
So how can that be like the marquee play? To, like, I got to go because they're winning championships. UConn's winning championships. Other teams are winning championships. Kansas is winning championships. Kentucky's not winning championships. Even with the guy that can go get the talent, they're not winning championships. So why would I want to go there now that he's gone? It's not a marquee place to me for, for, and for, for young individuals to go because they were going to Kentucky. Why? Because Coach Cal was going to make them NBA ready. They were going to be these one and done. Mm-hmm. You think they're going now? I do. So I'll follow that up with, uh-huh. well, are they going to Arkansas? I don't know. I'm not saying they're going to Arkansas either. And, and I don't know either. Yeah. But if I'm, let's say, a 16, 17-year-old five-star and I've gotten you know, offers from Kentucky and Duke and UConn and UNC, I'm not going to go to Arkansas necessarily. And it's not a mm-hmm. bad program in the slightest. No. I mean, Arkansas has a storied history of basketball. But it's not Kentucky. So I think it's both. I think it's both the allure and the draw of how good of a recruiter John Calipari is and the resume that he has. And also, you get to wear Kentucky blue. You get to play for the Kentucky Wildcats. I think that matters to 16, 17-year-old kids. See, that's, Arkansas that's doesn't that's have that question. same draw. That's my question as I get older, mm-hmm. right, and I uh, am more of the dinosaur, right, because that, uh, to me, absolutely should be what Kentucky has to offer that very few other programs can match, right? And Arkansas is But no what are flat. they offering, Willie? But, see, that's my question, is we now live in this world of NIL, mm-hmm. and you could probably go to some kids saying, well, that's nice and everything. I love Rupp Arena. That's 25,000 fans. That's awesome. But I'll go play in front of a half – full arena if I'm getting paid twice the money there for NIL that I am for Kentucky. And so Kentucky, they shouldn't have a shortage of NIL either. So right. all things being equal, that's what Kentucky can offer that very few others can offer is that, that history, that, you know, that deep, deep passion that their fan base has and I, the sheer numbers. Like when you go on the road uh-huh. and you play for Kentucky, those Kentucky fans, I don't care if the game is in Hawaii – or Red Deer, Alberta, where Chris Mason is from, in the middle of the snowstorm. The Kentucky fans will take over that They're gym. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. But that, that was only with Cal. We've seen that Oh, with no, Cal. no. It was, but it was but before Pati- Cal. But they Patino were, had no, no, it going. But Patino was winning. Which you, yeah. They were winning championships. Yeah. But it, was, it goes back to Adolph Rupp. I mean, they this were is deep-rooted. It's they in the were blood. Winning, they if, were you, winning, if you're born in Kentucky, I mean, you just you, they were you winning, care. They were that white song starts playing. I don't care where you are. You start clapping. You're talking about Kentucky Residents, you're talking about <laughs> people that live in Kentucky, it's even that live Kentucky in Lexington, right? Uh, but, but what I'm saying is this: you're right. It's a, you're, you got you to get to the yeah. you got to get the national recruit. When yeah. Calipari walks into your living room, and you're a five star athlete, five star basketball player. What are you and your your parents thinking? He's going to get me to the NBA mm-hmm. after one. Season. That's the allure That's a big of one. going in Kentucky. It's not that they win championships, but they haven't won a championship in over a decade. It's not that they're just this dominating team during the tournament. It was Coach Cal that brought these individuals in. Now that he's gone, you either got to find somebody that can recruit like Coach Cal, mm-hmm. and there are not many out there that can. And if they are, they probably already got jobs, and it would cost a lot to pull them away from the jobs that they have. Either you're going to have to find someone like Coach Cal, or you're going to start to shrink right back into the middle of college basketball. You are because there's no, to me, the allure of Kentucky, even me, I watch Kentucky basketball because I was seeing future first-round picks, future lottery picks. That's what I wanted to see. They may not have those guys anymore. Why am I going to watch them? That, that's the double-edged sword now, too, is that used to be an easy way to win. If you exactly, could dominate yeah. the one-and-dones, mm-hmm. which is how he won a lot early, but now it's, it's hard to win with the one-and-dones. It's a different landscape. Yeah. yeah. But I disagree with you, G. Mays, because uh-huh. I think Kentucky's bigger than Calipari. And I'll compare it to Alabama football. Mm-hmm. Nick Saban was bigger than Alabama football. Yeah. He was. He, uh-huh. he changed the university. He changed the city of Tuscaloosa. And frankly, he changed the state of Alabama. Mm-hmm. If I was a five-star player committed to play for the University of Alabama and I heard the news that Nick Saban was retiring, I'm out. Because mm-hmm. I came here to play for you. I don't care about what color I'm wearing. I don't care about what stadium I'm playing in. I want to play for you because you're a proven winner and I will win a championship and I will more than likely probably be a first-round pick. I think Kentucky brings more of a luster 
Kentucky itself, the brand itself, the history itself brings more of a luster. And Calipari is, was at least synonymous with Kentucky football, that he helped bring basketball, that allure. Yeah. Excuse me, basketball, thank you. He helped bring that allure, that he had that, what is it, 35, 38 NBA, first round NBA draft picks, that of course Calipari brings a massive part of it uh, to it. But I think Kentucky's going to be just fine. And that is dependent on the coach. Mm -hmm. Do you bring in a coach that kids do still want to play for? Because I think it was the same thing with Alabama football. If you bring in a coach that can win and recruit and can coach like Nick Saban, fruit and struggles to win games, well, then, yeah, the luster is going to fall off. But I think the brand of Kentucky itself can carry itself to a certain extent. Well, you you got to find the right guy. You just said it. You just said that, listen, if you can't bring in the recruits, then it's, it's going to be bad. Wh who was the one person that brought in the recruits? Calipari. Well, he's the only coach. Ca Ca but I'm just saying, the one person that brought – and I'm talking about in the nation. When you talk about recruits, you looked at Coach Calipari. He was always yeah. going to be in the top three or four in recruiting classes. He, to me – I know Kentucky's a storied university. I get it. But within the last 10 years, he was Kentucky. Calipari was Kentucky basketball. When you talk Calipari, you talk Kentucky. When you talk Kentucky, you mention Coach Calipari. You didn't mention, you know, the coaches that won before Calipari. To me, Calipari was bigger than Kentucky basketball over the last 10 years. That's why they held on to him for so long. Like, dude, you're not winning. I think the $35 million buyout had no, a good uh, bit to do with why they held on I, to him for so long. That, but what I'm saying is this. Even with the $35 million, they could have paid that and, and went and got another coach. They got enough money. They, they could have paid that if they really wanted to move, but they were scared. Why? Because he was bringing in the recruits. He became Kentucky basketball, Coach Calipari. There's, if you say Coach Calipari around the country, they know exactly which university you're talking about. Yeah, he's he got was a brand. The, he, he was the brand of Kentucky. And that's now you take that away, how are you going to replace that? It's not going to be the place that – because I look at Coach Cal like I look at um, Nick Saban, not from a championship, championship standpoint, but from a standpoint of I can bring you in. I got the cachet to bring you in. Only thing I got to do is sit in your living room, give me five minutes, and I'll get you to come to, come to Kentucky. Okay, cause I, I, that's that's, it's, it's to an me, interesting, he was bigger than Kentucky. It's an interesting perspective you have because I think there will be a lot of traditional Kentucky fans mm -hmm. that would say, oh, they're staying. we'll yes. be fine. I, I, we'll I, be I fine. We are Kentucky. When our jersey says Kentucky, when we walk out there and you're at Rupp Arena, we will replace as great as Cal was, we will find the next guy. They tried, I, to, find, they tried to find a guy after Rick Pitino, and it took a couple of shots before they yeah. did that. Well, you see, that's the, one of the most interesting uh, stages was Tubby Smith, uh -huh. right? Because exactly. it, he did win a national but championship Tubby was the coming first off year. Of Rick Pitino's he was. Players. And then, you know, he won a lot, but uh -huh. it was just not quite up to their standard. They thought they could do better. Tubby left before the posse hit him, very similar to Cal. And then they got stuck with Billy Gillespie. They had a little yeah. reality check. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> Whoa. It's like, oh, okay. We slid back right. into the middle. But I still think that of there, there is an ego there, and there is a belief that we are, as Kentucky, we are the epicenter of college basketball like no other. So I don't care who That's the coach is. The they coaches will come and go. The coaches will come and go. Uh -huh. But we are Kentucky we are the best job in they America. That's how they will up. feel about That's it. That's how they feel. Yeah. They're setting themselves up for failure if they do that. <laughs> They're setting themselves up for failure. It, and it's I'm it's your greatest failure for the next It's your greatest five strength, years. but it's also your greatest weakness, yeah. right? I think that could be how to describe it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's fair. I think that's kind of how I approach the Alabama search as well. It's because I think that a lot of Alabama football fans approach it like we're Alabama. Of course, Dan Landon right. or Mike Norvell. A Kentucky fan would be Sark like, why are you laughing? We're offering you the Kentucky job. Dan Hurley, a, a UConn fan, like, why do I want to go to Kentucky? Yeah, why We've I won a to ton of there? national championships, way more than Kentucky has yeah. the last 20 years. Why? We're the powerhouse, not you guys. Right. But Kentucky fans are like, what are, what are you talking about? We're Kentucky. But that's a telling sign <laughs> when you have these great coaches or coaches that are on the cusp of greatness. They're like, nah, we're good. 
keep your job. <laughs> We're good right here. We're not, I don't want to go over there. And it's different now because it's more complicated now yeah. because you have so many more questions of, okay, well, how much NIL support am I going to get from this collective? What kind of support am I going to get from the athletic department? Things like that that are a little, add more layers to the move. But I think the point that you bring up, d is a very fair one that uh-huh. nobody could recruit like Cal. Uh-huh. But there's also a lot of coaches out there that win a lot more than Cal. Yeah, you're like, right. I, 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 hey, that, that's why he's not at Kentucky anymore. Exactly. You okay, know, so. I'm going to throw out a, a name just to ponder. Uh-huh. Scott Drew, would that be the guy? Let's let's come back with no. that. Coming up next, we'll give our thoughts on that. Scott Drew, the head coach at, at Baylor. We'll get into your thoughts as well. Caroline Willie D. Mace, tune into 93.3 Classic Hits today as the Nashville Sounds take on the Memphis Redbirds on the road. Pre-game at 6.30, first pitch at 6.45 with coverage also available on the 93.3 Classic Hits app and at 93.3classichits.com. Sounds Baseball presented by Twin Peaks, Family Leisure, and Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning. Happy Tuesday, everyone. This is Derek Mason, and you've heard me tell you about Dr. Jeffrey Lodge and his staff at Cool Springs MD for some time. I've shared how they help with imbalanced hormones and how they offer a comprehensive weight loss program that addresses the root cause of weight gain. But now I want to tell you about a new laser they offer called Empowered Laser. Hey, listen, I, I, I had it done to myself. You know, for my abs, I'm trying to get these abs ready for the summertime, which I'm going to get there right now. I got one big ab. But um, after dealing with Jeff- Jeffrey Lodge and using this Empower Laser, I'm going to have me an eight-pack, people. I'm not going to show you, but I'm going to have it. It's going to be underneath that, so just know. With this laser, laser, Dr. Lodge and Cool Springs MD can help you turn back the clock and take control of your body, and that is what I'm doing. Learn about this amazing new laser and how it stimulates your Kegels in 20 minutes. The only laser indicated for mixed urinary stress incontinence and here about the tone feature, the tone feature, okay? The muscle stimulator that increases muscle production and tone in your stomach. That's why I used it. But not only do you, can you use it on your stomach, but you use it on your thighs, your love handles, arms, and more. Dr. Lodge and his team are ready to help you turn back the clock and take control of your body with the new Empowered Laser at Cool Springs MD. So. Visit their website. It's at coolspringsmd.com today.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays. We're live out here at Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena. Predators taking on the Winnipeg Jets tonight. And hey, Preds fans, don't miss tomorrow night's Smashville live show at Brewhouse 100 in Bellevue at 6 p.m. See your Predators star players up close and personal, plus get autographs and pictures. This week's special guests are Ryan McDonough and Luke Shen. Smashville Live is brought to you by the Black Abbey Brewing Company and ESPN Bet Sportsbook. We're talking Kentucky, and D Maze has gotten the people all he struck a chord. I, I knew he was going to. I was like, "Keep going, D Maze, because that is going to stir. It's like pouring gasoline on a fire." D Maze oh, hit yes. the nerve of all Kentucky <laughs> yes, blue nerves. Yes, I love it. <laughs> it's not D the same. D Maze says Calipari is bigger than Kentucky. I disagree, but Willie, you brought up a name at the break because Nate Oates has already said I'm staying at Bama. Uh, uh, Dan Hurley has already said, yeah, my wife would divorce me if I took the Kentucky job. I'm going to stay right here, and why would he leave? He just won back-to-back -back national championships. Jay Wright said, I'm not retiring. Willie, you brought up Scott Drew. I think that's an interesting one because I think Scott Drew's name has enough appeal that it fits. Like it, it fits like a Kentucky coach, not like, a, like I heard a couple of names thrown out there like Lamont, Lamont Paris at South Carolina. That's not a Kentucky fit. No. Scott Drew. Scott Drew has won a national one. championship. He is connected. He knows how to recruit. When he went to Baylor, Baylor was absolutely at the bottom. Remember, they were just a few years removed from the, to the scandal. That was, they made a 30 oh, yeah. for 30. They murdered a guy. I mean, it was, mm. The player murdered another player. It was awful. Lord. But he went there and... In a year, he had some players. I was like, how is he getting these guys to go to a program that has been at rock bottom? That is a, that's a, that's an, that's a skill. Yeah. I don't know how he was doing it, but he was doing it, right? And, and now there's, you don't, we're now in an era where people don't question, are, are you, what, what methods are you using to get the players? Because there's no, there's no rules. Yeah. So I don't think there's any question. He knows how to play the transfer game. He knows how to recruit. He can build a team. And maybe he's looking for something new. Maybe he's not. But I think if you're Kentucky, you're like, okay, Baylor, have you done everything that you can do at Baylor? How about trying to do the same thing at Kentucky? I think that's an intriguing guy. To me, that could be a target. What about Bruce Pearl? Oh, oh, Bruce. He's energetic enough, I tell you that. I oh, mean, uh, my goodness. He's pops a, a character. Pops a blood vessel every single yeah. night. And, and I think, I think God, Bruce, that, that's a guy that I think you could – if you get, you can – he still can get those guys that Calipari was getting. Uh, he has more of a shot if you – outside of the, the big names that are like wish list guys that are not leaving um, their university or not coming out of retirement. I think Bruce Pearl is that one guy that can, you know, keep your, your program where it is now. He can keep it there. Um, but how long will he be able to keep it there? Will he eventually be like Coach Cal, getting all the recruits? We're winning during the regular season, but ain't winning, you know, in 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 the um in the tournament mm -hmm. because it's not like Bruce Pearl. Pearl is winning championships either. His teams have lost, and he has a really good team. They just uh, lost to Yale. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's, it's not like WC he's taking his team, team to Final Four. You've heard me be pretty critical of Bruce Pearl through the years. Now, obviously, it's a new era uh -huh. now. So the whole thing about how he got a show cause, he put Tennessee on probation, set them back for a while, even though he won big, and there's a lot of Tennessee fans would take him back today, right, because he was so popular. I also but don't if get you why there's so many people that love Bruce Pearl so much more yeah. than Rick Barnes. Like, right. And he, I know. Look, he, he's got They're charisma. They're both good coaches. He, there's, there's not an he's issue likable. of charisma. He's there's likable. not an issue of getting players – I just feel like it might be a little sensory overload. The microscope he'd be under at Kentucky and the way he operates, and I won't go into a ton of detail, but when, you, when he would be scrutinizing every move he makes, I think he is in a great spot just knowing him the way – I mean, I don't know him personally, but just watching him, how he go, goes about it. Auburn's a great place for him because uh -huh. he's away from the spotlight a little bit, but he's created this – little oasis of amazing showcase theater down there in a program that was desperate for it. I think he's great in the spot he is, I, I, to me. I, I, 
I don't think he's the fit at Kentucky because think- at Kentucky, every time he goes out somewhere, and he likes to go out. Like he likes, yeah. he's, he likes to be among the people. But is it too much in a place like Lexington as opposed to Auburn? Just my, just my thought from afar. And, and I, I mean, I think it's, his job would be a little bit safer at Auburn. No question. Was, yeah. If he has a bad year at Auburn, Kentucky, yeah. no big deal. He'll be back in the next year. Uh-huh. You have a bad year at Kentucky, wait a minute, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Bruce, what's going on? You know, Especially after they went, yeah, what, they, expect- what they went through with Coach Cal, mm-hmm. and then you don't even, you know, you don't even get to where Coach Cal got or you, it's a disappointment throughout the season. You have too many of those at Kentucky. They're going to be looking to replace you. At 100%. Yeah. I mean, the leash is short. Yeah. We know that. I want to get into your thoughts on this. We've got a bunch of phones. We are right into your phones on this coming up next. Plus, Dime said, well, I think Calipari is bigger than Kentucky. Yeah. I think that's the number one fear of Kentucky fans, that they can argue with you all they want, and they can say that that's not true all they want, but I think that is their number one fear. How close are we to that becoming a reality of Kentucky maybe not being Kentucky anymore? What's the timeline for this next coach? How quickly do you have to have proven success at Kentucky before we view Tennessee, Auburn, Florida, Alabama as being more of the premier programs in the SEC? We'll get into that coming up next. Caroline, Willie, D. Mace. We're brought to you by Zen Sports. Start earning cash rewards on your bets today. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-889-9789. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older and in Tennessee to bet. Hey, you've heard me talking a lot about FNM Bank. We love the Take It to the Bank segment every Friday. Another edition coming up in a couple of days. But remember... I want to tell you about business owners, all the different ways that FNM Bank makes your banking easy on purpose. That's their motto. Owning your own business is like having another member of your family. It always takes that time and attention, requires money, and you need the right tools to have success. Well, FNM Bank will treat your business like family. That's what has made it such a great, successful operation, and they've connected with a lot of people who own businesses. So no matter what your business goals You'll reach them easier when you have a banking relationship that supports you, the tools to manage your money coming in and out, and the expertise to make your business better. So bank your business at F&M Bank. Decisions that are made locally from a bank that your business means more to them. So find the nearest location to you. There are 20 in our listening area. Visit myfmbank.com. That's myfmbank.com. Equal housing lender, member FDIC.
Caroline, Willie, D. Mays, 1025-1063, The Game, and The Game Nashville app, streaming live on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook Live every single day. And we are broadcasting from the Busy Bee Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning Game Nashville Studios, home of the $99 yearly Beehive membership, where the buzz is always about great service. And our studio today is Barrel House at Bridgestone Arena. Predators taking on the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Puck drop at 7 o'clock. Win tonight, and you clinch. Get it to overtime tonight, and you clinch. Predators just need one single point to clinch the playoffs. And I do want to get into the game tonight. You know, maybe looking ahead, if you do clinch tonight, what tonight means, where you go from here. I want to get into that. I want to get you into your phones on the Kentucky and Cal situation. But, Dimes, you brought up, you said, I think that Calipari is bigger than Kentucky basketball. Yep, and that's what Kentucky fans fear. That's their biggest fear. Mm -hmm. And... I think in this day and age, in college sports in general, college basketball, college football, women's college basketball, whatever you want to look at, things change quickly. Oh, yeah. A few years ago, UConn men's basketball is kind of a joke. <laughs> like, if you would have said back-to-back -back UConn national championships, like in 2018-19, I would have assumed that you were talking about the women's uh -huh. team. Yeah. That Although, Jim Calhoun had a great run, but when he left, that was when it was like, ooh, you know the big e they had a their football team was going through some stuff right are they going to so that's when they had they were at the crossroads mm -hmm. like are they still a big time program right right and things can change very quickly this is a fickle little sport and i think kentucky fans understand that now the sec is much more competitive mm -hmm. in basketball than it ever has been before that it, before it was really just kentucky and then Florida had a run, and Tennessee had a run, and Vanderbilt had a run, but it was really just Kentucky and everybody else. That's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Auburn was a national championship contending team. Tennessee was a national championship contending team. Alabama made it to the final freaking four. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's not just you anymore. So I think that ten, excuse me, Kentucky fans fear that. So I'll ask you, before we get into some of your thoughts on this, how long is the leash for this next coach? It's going to be very short, I, I tell you that. Um, you know, because this program, the last however long Cal's been there, 17 years, somewhere around there, give or take some years, more so give some years. Um, for the most part, this has been a winning program. Now, I have once they got in the tournament, it's been something totally different. Mm -hmm. But this has been a winning program since Coach Calipari has taken over. Check out his first his first recruiting class, and this is why Kentucky fans need to be scared. Because, one, the landscape has completely changed. And I understand people saying, well, Kentucky is Kentucky basketball. Yeah, when the landscape wasn't the way it is now, it was Kentucky basketball. But now that the landscape has changed, it ain't no longer Kentucky basketball anymore. You ain't just showing up at somebody's door and, and they're coming. And they're like, oh, my goodness, let's, let's follow, you know, whoever it is that's the coach of Kentucky. Let's just follow him mm -hmm. to Lexington. It's not like that anymore. Check out his first class. John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins. And those were his two, like two of his biggest signings, first year as coach of the uh, University of Kentucky. You got John first Wall. Year was the John Wall. Oh, year? oh nine, yeah. His okay. first class was um, John Wall and Demarcus Cousins. Then they had Daniel Orton and um, Eric um, Eric Blesshaw. For some Ooh. reason, I thought that was later, but that I was the oh nine. Yeah, that was the oh, oh, oh nine ten. Can the next coach? Duplicate what Coach Cal did in regards to bringing in recruits. Mm -hmm. That's what Kentucky fans are scared of because if he, if they if they don't, this they're going to fall right back into the middle of college basketball. They're not going to be seen as the big bad Kentucky University basketball team anymore. That's what they fear. Yep. Let's get into some of your phones on this. 615-737-1025 is our phone number. Our phone lines are driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Kenny the Mailman is on the line with a thought on Kentucky. Go ahead, Kenny. What's up? Hello, good friends. Willie, you are going to love this call because I know you love history, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Winston Churchill said this about the pilots that saved England after the Battle of Britain. Never have so few done so much to save so many. When you talk about John Calipari, never has one done so little with so much and have made so many mad. We talk about this mythical recruiting championship he wins every year, gets the trophy. That means nothing. I think in the past 10 years, an average SEC, he's won three championships and only two outright. 
bringing the players in. About four years ago, he started saying, my goal is not to win championships at Kentucky. It's to get players to the NBA. That day, they should have asked him to resign for cause. Because can you imagine Saban or Kirby Smart saying, well, I'm just getting these draft choices to the NFL. We're not going to win championships. That was one of the most absurd statements I've ever heard. Y'all have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you, Kenny. And I, I remember at the height of that, I do remember asking, because he was still the hot guy. Remember, that he was just a few years past the Billy Gillespie, uh-huh. uh, Billy Gillespie debacle. Yes. So Kentucky fans were going with it. But I remember asking Kentucky fans, because I, I remember the era, and I played in the era, when they had Richie Farmer and John Pelfrey and Darren Feldhouse and just it's Sean Woods, the beloved homegrown guys that were the, just the, the soul, right, yeah. of Kentucky there for four years. And, you know, Jamal Mashburn was there for a couple years. Yeah. He was obviously a huge part of that group. But that first Patino crew, they put those people's numbers in the, in the rafters mm-hmm. because they meant so much to the Kentucky fans. And I remember asking Kentucky fans, are, is, are you okay with that trade-off, you know, having these great talents come in, but they're only there for one year? They're there for one year. You can't, you can't get to know them like like they did, in the per in the in the different times where you you know you really got to know a player, watch them grow, freshman to sophomore, sophomore to junior. Mm-hmm. So there was a trade off there, and Kenny's point is a good one, right? Because Calipari, he, he kind of fell in love with that whole thing. He loved being at the draft and look at all these guys. I'm I'm getting there, and it helped him get the next crop of guys. Yeah. But it didn't necessarily equate to the perfect team, mm-hmm. you know, except for the one that he won. Yeah. But, but, okay. And then there was another one that was undefeated uh-huh. all the way into the loss in the final yeah, four. Yeah, that was the yeah. – um, Carl Anthony Carl Towns Anthony was Towns, the main yes. guy. But my thing is, I hear Kenny and Kentucky fans. I hear him. Oh, no, no, you did so, so little with so much. I hear you. But what happens when you ain't bringing in that so much? Mm-hmm. What happens then? It's all fine and dandy now. Yeah, get rid of them. Let's go. You know, and they're right. Listen. He was getting the classes. He was getting the recruiters. I mean, the recruiting classes. But he wasn't winning at the clip he was getting the recruits. So I get it. You got to let him go. But don't sit here and say, no, we're, we're, we're done because he did so little with, with too much. Mm-hmm. What happens when you don't have all of that that he was bringing in? Those five-star recruits he was bringing in that everybody in the country was coveting. When you don't have that, then how are you as a university in regards to winning basketball games? I think that was Kenny's point, and also probably a lot of Kentucky fans' frustration was, mm-hmm. I understand why the are you losing so yeah. many games, and why can you not get past the first or second because round of the Coach tournament? Because Coach Cal is not a good coach, like a good X's and O's strategy coach. He's proven that he's not. He's a damn good recruiter. Mm-hmm. That he is. Yeah. But when you're talking about coaching over the season, critical moments, he hasn't. He hasn't stacked up against the greats. One text your text in says, don't forget, Wall and Cousins were committed to Memphis and followed him to Kentucky. It's always been about Cal. That is not specific to Cal. Exactly. Recruits follow coaches. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's, it's a thing in For football. better or worse. It's mm-hmm. a thing in, in basketball. Recruits follow coaches. It happens. We were talking about Alabama earlier. A lot of recruits decommitted from Alabama because they didn't go to Alabama to go to Alabama. They played. They go to. They went to Alabama to play for Nick Saban. It happens all the time when coaches get new jobs. Their players follow those coaches. So that's not specific to Cal. No. And I also think that if Cal had gone from Memphis to Mercer. Like, would Boogie Cousins follow him to Mercer? <laughs> Probably not. That's was, a great, that'd be a good test. It was Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not like you're going from Memphis to nowhere. It's not like you're going from Memphis to a rinky-dink program. You're going from Memphis to Kentucky. But, but, there, that there was Kentucky but that was Kentucky almost 20 years ago. That was college basketball almost 20 years ago. You can't say that now. Like, you can't say, oh, they're going to X school, X school because of the school. They're not doing that. These kids are not doing that no, anymore. No, they've never done Except, that. But what I'm saying is now you can't just – people are saying, well, Kentucky going to remain Kentucky. That's just who they are. You can't sell program alone anymore. That's probably 5% of what you're selling. You're selling NIL and NBA, the two no. ends, NIL and NBA. That's what you're selling to these kids. You're not selling, oh, we got this massive, huge program because you know who else got that massive, huge program? 
just about every other college out there too. And there, I, I don't know exactly where this all sits now, but you know the shoe companies uh-huh. have still got to be in there somewhere, right? That was what, where the whole scandal with the FBI was but coming. But that's probably not as big anymore but that, because of NIL. And I wonder how they are, have, have sort of dialed in to the NIL because mm-hmm. I, there are certain coaches, and Cal's one of them, mm-hmm. Bob Huggins comes to mind. That uh, let's, let's take Bob Huggins. Mm-hmm. Cincinnati, Kansas State. West Virginia. There's no connection between those three places. Mm -mm. But Bob Huggins went to all three places, and he's got his guys. Mm -hmm. He knows how to get his guys, right? He's got the – you had the connections. So I think there are certain players that through the connections, and now NIL being certainly a huge part of it, it's like, oh, we're going to West Virginia uh, with Coach Huggins instead of – Manhattan, Kansas, Kansas State. Okay, okay cool. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so you know, can, I'm still can, getting my uh, NIL and all the stuff with the shoe company and everything. My AAQ, AAU coach wants me uh-huh. to do this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can it, it's can, less about, oh, Kentucky. Uh-huh. Ooh. Yeah, and that's it, what it, I'm, it's, it's not as much and about that's that. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. not as much about Kentucky. And my thing is, because I don't know mm-hmm. in, in regards to NIL, can these shoe companies – Offer NIL deal. I don't know. Like I don't know. Nike, I, that's an interesting Reebok question. I hadn't thought about because that. Because if they can, it takes away that sort of, you know, we're rep by, you know, Nike. We are a yeah. Nike school. They can. They so, can? Like, Caitlin Clark is a Nike athlete. Okay. Like, she's in the Nike commercials. Mm-hmm. And this was actually a big conversation. I believe it was last season mm-hmm. because Flaugé Johnson, who plays for LSU, she had a Puma deal. But LSU is a Nike, Nike school. school. yes. But you can get NIL deals from, like, Nike, Reebok, Puma, Adidas, so on and so forth. You can. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, even, even that, like, I don't have to go to Kentucky to wear or to get Nike apparel or something. I can get a Nike deal and go across the street somewhere else, and they may not be a Nike school, but I want to wear Nikes. They're going to give me an NIL deal. I can go over here. I don't necessarily have to go to Kentucky. There are more obstacles for Kentucky in regards to recruits than there ever was. 20 years ago, there was not all these obstacles, NIL and transfer and all this other stuff. So Kentucky was like, hey, you come here, you're going to the NBA. That's just the way we are. But it's not that way anymore. Wherever I can, wherever I can maximize my ability to play this game from a financial standpoint and obviously from a play standpoint to get to the NBA, there, that is where I'm going. Or the coach that can get me there. Coach Cal can get me there. Mm-hmm. Coach Cal is bigger than UK. He is because he gets them to the NBA. UK don't get them to the NBA. Coach Cal does. So wherever Coach Cal goes, there are going to be people that follow him. He's bigger than UK. UK is going to find that out pretty soon. I think and they're scared about that. I, but I also think that the good case study of that is going to be, well, what does Arkansas become? Yeah, you're right. Ar- See, because Arkansas is an interesting mix because back in the day, like when they had Nolan Richardson and had that going, uh-huh. their fan base was rivaling, ri- it was a rivaling fan Kentucky. Base, they, they could bring it, and, and they lost it for a while. But I still think it's there. Like when, when they're good. And maybe Cal's the guy that can energize it a little bit. I think it'll energize Cal to, to maybe have that challenge. You got some big money people for Arkansas. You got the spotlight in that area. You know, they want the raise. They remember those days. Like, it can – it's a potential. They want it. It's yeah. They want those You days. bring good players Didn't there. Didn't Richardson's son coach for Arkansas? Or was it him? No, I know his, John Thompson's son coached for Georgetown. No, it, that may be his what son I'm actually of. was coached at Tennessee State. Didn't go very oh, okay, well. Okay, he was an yeah. assistant for, for, for a while. Yeah, okay. But uh, they had Mike Anderson, mm-hmm. who was the, the right-hand man for Nolan Richardson for a while. They just, they just hadn't found that the, the guy who could recreate that. It was uh-huh. hard. That was pretty unique. Oh, yeah, those years. What Nolan Ooh, Richardson man. had. Wow. They, they had it rocking. What do they call it? 60 minutes? 40 of, minutes of 40 hell. 40 minutes of hell, of hell. yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it was. I can tell you. I was, I was in there. I, <laughs> I experienced a few nights. I had some, some rough nights. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, wasn't spe- I was out there like, in for Donick. <laughs> Turn over. <laughs> Get him out of there. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> They took you out quickly, Willie. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Quick hook. Got to handle the heat. Can't stand the heat. Get out of the kitchen. Uh, another uh, texture text in says, no coach is going to publicly say that they're talking to anyone before a deal is done. Kentucky can make an offer to Hurley more than UConn can. Look, everyone does have a price. Like, if Kentucky throws $20 million a year at Dan Hurley, is he going to say no to that? I think he will. You think? Yeah. I, I, I think. $20 million. 
I, I think his reaction to that question was all you need to know. Yeah. I don't think they would ever offer, but like you said, if they offer that, I guess that's something you have to seriously like think about because that's a lot of money um, in front of you. Um, but if you gotta if you gotta offer that much money, what does that tell you? You ain't the university you thought you were. When you got to offer double of what somebody else is making. And that was just a number. Right? I know, I know, I yeah. know. But if you have to offer, say, say I'm um, Hurley is making, I don't know how much he's making. Say he's making $5 million or let's say $7 million or $6 million. Because I, I heard Greenberg on today and said they probably can offer him up to 7.5. They were talking about UConn and Hurley, so, which tells me that he's making probably around five, somewhere around that four or five. They would have to offer him $10, 12000000 million just to go to Kentucky. That, that says more about your university than anything, that I got to pay you that much money to come here. I got to pay you over double what you're making there just to get you to come here, and I'm supposed to be the blue blood? I'm supposed to be Kentucky? Well, is Dan Hurley going to leave a place where he won back-to-back -back national championships? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, yeah. And he's, he, this is his pro. Like, he has this program right where he wants it. He's, I, don't, I can't see him picking up and leaving and going to – now, it may happen. I don't know. But you would have to offer a whole bunch for him to leave UConn. And then, yeah. to me, that says more about the coach than the university. That tells me that the coach is bigger than the university. It ain't the other way around. Well, Dan Hurley, I believe, is bigger than UConn. What I'm saying is, is he's bigger than, than UK. If you got to offer him that much money to, to lure him away from UConn, because like you said, he's bigger than UConn. He's, he's, he's going to have a statue at the University of UConn. He win another championship. So you got to offer double that to bring him there? Yeah, that says something about that head coach. He's bigger than your program, and you want your program to match your head coach. Kentucky's program, if they, again, if they got to offer that much money, and I know the going rate is – is, is a lot of money. But if you got to offer that much money to get a coach, that tells you you're scared about your program going downhill and you're not the program that, you, that you're that you telling everybody you are. See, I disagree. I think that's just the name of the game. I think that's it's just It's the what name of the game, but still. You have to do. I, but again, if I am this big, bad University of Kentucky, I sit on the top of the hill of Blue, blood, blue Bloods, which they don't, but I'm going to say they do. I shouldn't have to offer you double than what you're making now. I could just say, hey, listen, you making five over there, I pay you seven and a half, eight million dollars to come. I don't have to pay you ten, twelve million dollars. Why? Because it's a, it's an honor to come to the University of Kentucky. You should be thankful that we even reaching out to you. That's sweet and all, but like I know, on. but that but Kentucky's not Kentucky. Kentucky's a good program. I'm not saying that. Kentucky, Kentucky I think, is one is of the a best good jobs program, in America. But they are not what they used to be. And I think they will – I think Kentucky fans are going to start to find that out. Now, they've had it good with Coach Cal, not great. They've had it really good with Coach Cal. And their frustration is not that he can't win during the regular season, he can't win during the tournament with the players that he has. If you don't get those players and you ain't winning during the, uh, during the season, you're going to fall right back amongst the rest of the uh, college um, basketball teams. You're going to just fall in the middle. Right back into your phone. And today, as Vanderbilt Baseball takes on... ...and countertop experts, visit SmokyMountaintops.com.
Since our season ended, Ellen and I have spent a lot of time thinking about our time here at Kentucky. Uh, what it means to us, the friends we've made. On that court, regional championships, conference championships, final fours, the national title um, in 2012. It's been a beautiful time for us. This is a dream job. It was my dream job. Anybody in our profession looks at the University of Kentucky in basketball and said, that is the bluest of blue. The last few weeks, we've come to realize that this program probably needs to hear another voice, that the university as a whole has to have another voice giving guidance about this program that they hear. And the fans need to hear another voice. We've loved it here, but we think it's time for us to step away and step away completely from the program. All right, that was John Calipari in a statement that he released on Twitter just a few minutes ago, officially <laughs> resigning from Kentucky. Why are you laughing, D-Mang? Because you're going to say, Kentucky is the bluest of the blue. you damn right they are. The <laughs> colors are blue. So they are the bluest of the blue. I mean, gosh. Now? <laughs> See, that's why you love Coach Cal. <laughs> he knows how to work it. He first. knows he how to work, work it, boy. He, he knows, knows, how knows how the work right it. things to <laughs> say. There, there will be John Calipari Day someday mm -hmm. in Kentucky. It's got to have the right amount of time that passes. But 15 years, he was consecutively there longer than any Kentucky coach other than Adolph Rupp. Yeah. Which is awfully impressive considering that he only won one national championship yeah. in that span. And we but, all like, know. Only one. We act like that's nothing to win. Only one. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of people that coach for a long time, never get but the see, one. But see, here's the deal. And it, it's, it, it, that's, the t that's the tricky part, right? It's because you felt like he had the talent oh, he, to yeah, win he did. way more than that. Uh -huh. And Kentucky fans might say that. But still, I look at it and like, you know, he got one. That's, he got that's, one. That's, different. that's a different category than the couldn't win the big one. Well, even with – I think he gets so much flack and the university gets so much flack. Well, got, have gotten so much flack. Is because I look at, you know, you know, whether it be him, the comparison to me is he and Izzo. Yes, Izzo's only won one championship as well. But Izzo, if I believe if Izzo had the recruiting classes that Coach Cal had, then Izzo would have won more. Because it, to me, Izzo's is a better coach. He coaches these guys up. Recruiting is part of uh, coaching. But recruiting is a part of coaching too. But once he gets these recruits, he coaches them up, and they, they end up being good good teams. So people look at Kentucky as, man, you had all these five-star guys, and you only got one championship. Mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why people are so baffled, and, and, and they're upset too. That's why it was time for them to go. Like, you're not at, you know, southwest Louisiana, and you're getting marginal talent, mm -hmm. and you're, 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 you're struggling at times, but then at times you do get into the time. You're not at a – you're at Kentucky. You're at one of, you know – bluest of the blue like he said and you're not winning even with the recruits you're not winning at a clip that you should be winning and it's considering not even, the players it's not even just championships like you should be able to beat oakland yeah and, and you, you should, should win sec to beat championships Peters. too yeah. and you should beat oakland and you shouldn't lose to some of these teams that you end up losing to in the tournament before we get back into your phones because we've got a bunch of phone calls and texts uh -huh. that i want to get to i have a name what if kentucky hired don staley Would they? Does, Would they uh, ever? My first question, because this used to come up a lot with Pat Summit, right? Pat Summit, when she was in her heyday, there would always be somebody, and there, the men's job came open a few times while she was during, during her reign, during yeah. her prime. And she, her answer was always, I don't want to be a, a coach for the men's problem. I want no. to champion women's basketball. That is my... Thing. So that's my first question. Is, would, well, Don's, would Don, would Don want Staley to, want yeah. to do that? And she might not. I don't but know. But we live in an age now where the, you know, we see on the NBA level, there's mm -hmm. some, a lot of assistant coaches now. Uh -huh. And so it, that's a, it's, a, it's a fair question to throw out there. Like Don Staley, I, we said this maybe two years ago when mm -hmm. she won the national championship. Like her list of accolades as uh -huh. a player and a coach – 
the combination of the two, I, I'm not sure anybody can match. I think right? she's a Hall of Famer independently. Yeah. As a player, right. independently. Right. As a coach, independently. And then you combine the two. I mean, she's a powerhouse. Yeah. So if there's anybody that could do it, she might be the one. But does she want that? I don't know if she wants that or not. And if I'm Kentucky, I at least entertain the thought. It's she's a damn good coach. I tell you that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be uh, unheard of to do mm -hmm. something yeah. like that. But, hey, listen, things are changing. And, you know, if, if they feel that she can get that program back to winning, champion, to winning some championships, then you try to make the best move for the university possible. And, that, and if that is, you know, contacting Staley's representatives, then that's what you do. I mean, if you feel – that's the route you need to go. To. But then it's a heck of a story. It would be a heck. But here, here's what here's what the narrative would be. And like it or dislike it, it's up to y'all. I'm just throwing it out. Y'all stoop that low that y'all got to go to the women's side and get a head coach. <laughs> I'm just telling you what people are gonna be saying. Whether and you may not like it, but that's what they're, they're that's going to come out. Probably not in those words. Stooping low to hire but, a coach who's won two national championships but I, I, in the I, I, last hey, listen, three years. I'm just saying. We what might have would different be, definitions of low. What, I'm, I'm saying what would be. They wouldn't phrase it like that, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it would be phrased like y'all had to go to the women's side. Kentucky. Blue <laughs> blood. We're bigger than the coach. Y'all had to go and get the best women's coach if you want your if you are so afraid of your it, ego i being like don bruised, staley i, I like being, don staley. like one text or text and says come on don staley even being brought up for the kentucky head coaching job is wild in a world of male dominated booster egos it would never happen if you want to get your ego in the way uh -huh. of hiring like if don staley is not the right coach that it's not the right style it's not yeah. what she wants then it doesn't work out but if you are so concerned about your ego that you wouldn't even entertain and they are a, a coach with the caliber of Don Staley and the resume of Don Staley, then that's fine. You go ahead and you go hire somebody else. You know, like, you, that's fine. Is it possible that Don Staley would say, let's take a look at the health of the women's game. Let's look at the audience that we've had. And she might feel that way as well. And, and like, maybe w when Pat Summit was coaching, there may be a financial gap mm -hmm. and a spotlight gap that has narrowed now, right? With the, the popular, we just, the last couple of days, we've been talking about just how popular the women's game has gotten. You know, she could just kind of say, you know what, we're good. Like, like we, we, I, I don't need anything more than I've got. I, we, our audience is enormous. I'm not getting this huge new audience by going to the men's side. We had a bigger viewership than the men's did. Yeah. And I think that, that, that might she, be for her. You know, she, she could have the same approach as Dan Hurley. Of, yeah. Uh, I have everything that I need here. Right. Like, I have all of the support. I have probably close to a lifetime contract, if not, mm -hmm. in fact, a lifetime contract. I've gotten to three Final Fours with two national championships in the last three years. I've won three national championships since I've been here. Why would I want to leave unless it is the a challenge? challenge. Yeah, the challenge, yeah. And that, that would be, I think, something that would be an interesting study is if you, pull, if you, if you put together a big group of right. men's coaches and women's coaches and you had a discussion of if you were to coach the other what would you have to change and that's what and i would, what think, would, how you, would you have to change your coaching and, and style because you've got your formula right yeah. don yeah. staley knows her formula of the type of player she's looking for how to recruit to her system at south carolina what works in the sec mm -hmm. and you would have to in theory change that i mean it, basketball is the same game but you know the styles how are, are not the, the, the recruiting to, yeah. is different, right? Yeah. How do you connect yourself? I think th that would be a great. I would love just in a think tank to hear that discussion. But then if somebody actually doing it would have to be the guinea pig, right. you know, to try to pull it off. And I'm not saying that they should, and I'm not saying yeah. that that's the best path. Uh -huh. I'm just saying, well, like, what if? Like, what? What if? Just because a, just there the, doesn't seem like an obvious candidate. That's like you got to get that guy, other than maybe a Billy Donovan. But if I'm a professional coach. Do I really want to enter this college sports no. landscape? Probably Unless not. Unless I know I'm getting fired pretty soon here. That's the only reason I <laughs> yeah. entertain it. But, no, that, I mean, going from the pros to the to college, it's just too much. Unless you are, unless you want all of that responsibility, the recruiting and all that other stuff, then, yeah, you go. But I'm, not, I'm sure not many professional coaches want to have to deal with more than just coaching. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to have to go out and recruit. Just don't want to do it. It's a lot. 
Like, oh, yeah. it's hard. Um, Lucas in Clarksville says Kentucky's not a top program anymore. Evidenced by a Nashville radio station that was crying for Cal to be fired, now saying the one that was failing UK is bigger than UK. Oh, boy. I was the one saying that I think that Kentucky should fire Cal. Mm -hmm. And I'm still the one saying that I think Kentucky is bigger than Cal. Exactly. I don't, I you think feel it, differently. Yeah, I think, I think Cal is bigger than Kentucky. Now, listen, whether – there's always circumstances to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I believe Coach Cal is a hell of a recruiter, hell of a recruiter. Do I think he's like one of the top coaches, like coaching X's and O's? Mm -hmm. No, I think his philosophy only took the University of Kentucky so far. They had to make a change, not because, you know, what he, like he couldn't recruit or anything else. It's just it wasn't working for them anymore. Yeah. So they had to move in another direction. Coach Cal, great recruiter, good coach, but he's not up in the upper echelon of coaches when you're talking about X and, X's and O's in, in, in college basketball. 100%. Dustin in Hopkinsville. And I know Dustin's a big Kentucky fan. Yeah. And let me just go ahead and say T's and P's to Dustin yeah. because I'm yeah. sure he's been losing some sleep over the uh -huh. past couple of days. So saying the list is getting shorter, LOL, no one knows what's in any candidate's head. You think Hurley's going to win a second championship in as many years? He did. He did. Um, and be asked about going to Kentucky to coach and disgrace UConn by entertaining it. He giggled, which in my opinion is a sign because he's not saying no. I just don't see it. Like, unless Kentucky throws him the bag and he's like, okay, fine. Like, I can't say no to this because everyone does, you know, any offer can sway anyone really to do anything. But this is the, this is the, but let's be realistic. Just a few moments after they won the championship. Exactly. Like, what is, I mean, but so, so his, his mind. mind, his mind isn't on it. But no, I, so what I think he will do, which most coaches do, is you kind of let the noise happen. You kind of just go down to the office. Hey, how you guys doing? You know, you talk to the AD, <laughs> and then there's probably a few things you want. Maybe uh -huh. a raise for this assistant. Maybe you, you scratch your own back a little bit. You earned it. You won two in a row, mm -hmm. and you get more stuff, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> hey, about that? What about that locker room we've been asking for? Wh whatever it is that's on they his got top right. checklist, right? right? I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's been built. Like you, we were talking about, they were not. They were not on the forefront of everybody's mind in the post Jim Calhoun when he left. Mm -hmm. They and they, I think it was Kevin Olley that took over. They had Ollie ended rough. up winning the championship, didn't? He? Yeah, he ended up winning the championship because right. of um, Coach Calhoun guys that so, were still there. But just just like any program, there's probably what's the next thing? Yeah. Like what do we need next? So you just you use it for leverage and then you stay where you're at. And That's what I think. Whenever there's an opening like this, you know agents start rubbing their hands together, <laughs> start stretching, yeah. and it's like, all right, Jimmy what can Sexton? I turn yeah, this into? I'm sure is it Jimmy Sexton's probably now got a third of the basketball coaches. It's good, but he, he's he's, he invented the game, right, of right. just here's how you work the leverage. It's leverage. You it's yeah. all leverage. And look, if, if Dan Hurley ends up at Kentucky, then good for Kentucky because they just found themselves probably the best coach on the market. Greg's in Mississippi and is on the line with a thought on the Kentucky job. Go ahead, Greg. What's up? I think the perfect guy for Kentucky is the Baylor coach. Drew, he's won a national championship. He's young. Mm -hmm. He's got a low buyout. you got to look at the buyouts, too. I also would look at the Gonzaga coach. He's to a point where I don't think he'll win the national championship in Gonzaga. He's been in the championship game with twice. Lost to North Carolina, lost to Baylor in the COVID year. See if he wants to step up and he wants to go somewhere where he can win a championship. But I want to ask you guys, y'all guys are doing a great job about the – just the Titans there and this draft maybe turning on what Harbaugh does there at five. I think he's – if you know Jim Harbaugh, he wants to run the football and say he takes the tackle. Could you see – I hope the neighbors falls to the Titans, but could you even see like a Marvin Harrison uh, falling if the Giants panic and try to move up, try to get a quarterback? Could one of those receivers – and I like uh, uh, Caroline's guy neighbors better – because he makes people break tackles and stuff. I know Harrison is supposed to be like prototypical, everybody liked him, but I think you get neighbors with those receivers they got in the free agency, then you then you may be cooking there. It'll just be up to levels. But uh, you guys keep up the good work. Appreciate thank you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. your call, Greg. Um, yeah, we talked about this earlier in the show, Willie. A Bill Barnwell article said that he thinks the Titans should trade up to take their tackle of choice to kind of leapfrog the Chargers, hmm. which is interesting. With what picks is my question? Yeah, they don't. They don't. Have That's a picks. lot. That's yeah. a lot to be giving up. They don't, uh, uh. Nah, I ain't trying to move up. 
Because y'all, y'all, y'all are allowing Jim Harbaugh to control this the, the first round. That's what they're they're doing. The minute Jim Harbaugh start talking, everybody start panicking. Man who drinks a glass of whole milk, exactly. You're letting him like, dictate your draft plan. Don't trust plan. somebody that drink whole don't milk. Don't trust someone <laughs> that drinks whole milk. All right, the Predators are in action tonight, taking on the Winnipeg Jets. All they need is one point, and they've got uh, they've got the playoffs clinched. What does that mean tonight? What does that mean moving forward? We'll get into that coming up next. Caroline Willie D. Mays, 1025, 1063 the game. How are we doing? Let's talk Lee Company. Tonight our coverage of the Predators continues at six o'clock. And you've got the Winnipeg Jets in town. The Predators magic number is one. Any point the Predators get or the Blues don't get from here on out puts the Predators in the playoffs. They'll try to do it themselves tonight. Also remember Barry Trotz will have his weekly conversation with Jared Stillman at 5 o'clock tonight. That is always must listen to if you're a Predator fan. And all of our coverage of the Predators is brought to you by Lee Company. If you're coming down to Smashville tonight, and by the way, I recommend that you do, get on down here and be a part of it. It has been a lot of fun to be here. And you'll see the Lee Company display all over the place. Plus, it's that time of the year. It's time to get the air conditioning unit checked if you haven't in the last year or so. Lee Company can help you with that. 615-567-1000. It's important because in, in July, in August, it'll start in June. We know this, right? You get those 95 degree days day after day after day. If your air conditioning unit is on the fritz, number one, you're going to get these high bills. And number two, you're going to be sweating in bed, and that's not anything anybody wants. So make sure you get it checked, and you'll enjoy your summer a lot more, believe me. Lee Company, 615-567-1000 or LeeCompany.com.
Caroline, Willie D, Mace. Chase and Big Joe have your chance to qualify to win a pair of tickets in the Eurostone Club to see Jeff Dunham this Sunday at Bridgestone Arena. This contest is brought to you by Green Trees Company, a family-owned cannabis company and dispensary providing high-quality legal THC products for anyone seeking medicine, relief, or wellness. Located in Hendersonville in a new location in West Nashville and available online at greentreescompany.com. Tune in tomorrow between 9 and 11 a.m. for your chance to qualify to win. All right, the Predators taking on the Winnipeg Jets tonight. Puck drop at 7 o'clock. Pre-game at 6 p.m. on 102.5 and 106.3 the game. And if the Predators win tonight, they clinch the playoffs. If the Predators get it to overtime tonight, win or lose, they clinch the playoffs. All the Predators need is one point. And I was listening to Robbie and Rex Road this morning, and Robbie kept calling us a big game tonight. And I'm thinking to myself, well, yes, it's a big game because you have the opportunity to clinch. But also, if the Predators lose tonight, then I expect them to beat Chicago on Friday, and then they'll clinch on Friday. Like, the Predators are going to clinch. The Predators are going to get one point from here until the end of the season. But there is something, really, about one, getting it over with, and two, getting to clinch at home. That, that'd be a lot of fun. I, you've got... You've got also, another test against a, a really, really good team that has eyes on big things in the playoffs. We know how strong Winnipeg is. They've got motivation. And right now, you know, it's interesting to think about this, but there's almost no chance the Predators will play the Jets in the first round. They, they, even though they're only six points apart in the standings and they play in the same division, there's almost no chance they would meet in the first round. But Winnipeg is playing to see if they can get home ice in the first round against probably Colorado. That's how it's shaping up right now. They also go to, go to Dallas, and then they go to Colorado after they stop by here. So they've got an interesting track from now to the finish line. Mm-hmm. So you're in, this, you know, you're in this group of teams that are, all have their goals, and we talked about it yesterday. Are you trying just to get into the playoffs, or are you trying to fight to get to wild card position number one? Because now it's looking more and more with Vancouver winning last night over Vegas. Mm -hmm. It's looking like if you can get wild card number one, you will play Vancouver. Wild card number two is going to play Dallas. Mm -hmm. So how much do you want wild card one? That's a question because the first thing is, well, you got to clinch. So try to take care of that tonight. But in the big picture, you got four games. The The more points you get, the better you can grab wild card position number one, and how bad do you want to go get that, as opposed to maybe getting the X by your name and then resting some people. Right, and that's the question, is what is the priority? Is resting players the priority? Honestly, knock on wood, my goodness, the Predators have been lucky enough to be fairly healthy. Right, but yeah. to, this is my point about tonight. If you don't clinch tonight, then you got to go get it on yeah. Friday, then you're yes. down to four days left in the regular season. you got three games. Mm-hmm. It's three games in four days. It, there's not a whole lot of resting you can do right. with, with guys in that period of time. So if you get it tonight, then you can, then you can have a meeting tomorrow and say, all right, how do we want to go about this? How so bad a, do we want to get wild card one? So it's a must. It's an important game because it allows you to better understand how I'm going to proceed with my yes. players. You, you, can, can, then, you can then get a game plan together. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The game plan has to be you got to clinch if you walk in here tomorrow without any points. Yeah. And it would be nice to be able to just control what you want to do. If you want to say, yes. hey, Friday, we're going to give our veterans a break. We're going to give them a rest because we've clinched it and we can. And we can afford to, you know, take the foot off of the gas a little bit. I said a couple of weeks ago, this was, I guess, coming off of the 18-game point streak. When we knew the Predators were going to make up the playoffs, it was just a matter of when. I said, I want to play Dallas. Now I'm not quite sure. <laughs> now I think it's how can you avoid Dallas? <laughs> not that Vancouver's any picnic because they're, they're, they're awfully good too. But yeah. uh, I do think if you ask a bunch of people who's the better team, who's the deeper team, I think most Dallas. people would say Dallas mm-hmm. is a little deeper, a little better, a playoff battle tested more than Vancouver. And has a high possibility of winning the President's Trophy this year. Yep. It looks awfully scary. They're playing going great right Dallas. now. Playing great, absolutely. That's going to do it for us today. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Barry Trotz will join Stillman and Company at 5 p.m. Pre-game at 6 p.m. Puck drop at 7 p.m. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Be love and love on your people. Peace.